Hollow Knight was a game that initially passed me by. I remember hearing a ton of buzz around it back when it released on PC in early 2017, and as well as the chorus of delighted adulation from both critics and gamers, my interest was also piqued by all the talk about the Dark Souls influences found in the game, because I'm kind of a fan of Dark Souls. But alas, the game was only out on PC, and I would not get into PC gaming at all for another 5 years meaning I'd have to wait around for quite a while before I could sink my teeth into it. The same way I'd had to wait months or even years for other PC classics to come to console like Slay the Spire, Sunless Skies and Darkest Dungeon. And indeed, a year and a half later when Hollow Knight finally arrived on the PS4, I eagerly bought it on release day. But surprisingly, after playing through the first hour or so, I remember feeling kinda disappointed. I wasn't immediately grabbed by the colourful cartoony tone and art style, the combat seemed a bit shallow at first glance, and I wasn't even all that sure it would be my type of game in the first place, because I've never been a big Metroidvania guy. For one, I've never actually tried a Metroid game at all, and the only Castlevania game I've ever played was Symphony of the Night, and I hope you won't be too disgusted at me for saying this, but that game has just never clicked with me. And so, being the superficial ignoramus that I was, I said, nah, and gave up with Hollow Knight after little more than an hour, going back to my 15th playthrough of Bloodborne, wishing to wash away the thoughts of cartoon bugs and grubs with blood and beasts. Ha! A kid's game about bugs, I said. Lame. Lame. Then, one weekend over a year later, I found myself bored with nothing new to play, and remembered I'd never really given Hollow Knight a fair shake, and thought, what the hell, let's give it another go. Funnily enough, the exact same scenario happened with Sunless Sea, which went on to become my favourite ever game. Now, Hollow Knight may not be my favourite ever game, but nonetheless, I am very glad I gave it another try that day, because my time with Hollow Knight over the subsequent fortnight would end up being one of the most magical gaming experiences of my life. Do not be deceived, as I first was, by Hollow Knight's cartoonish exterior, because at its core, this is a metroidvania of incredible depth. In fact, not even just at its core, because while the game might initially look and feel somewhat simple, you're only seeing a single layer of what it has to offer, and with each new location discovered and character met, each new story revelation unearthed, each new additional gameplay element unlocked and boss encountered, Hollow Knight's true depth and scale is gradually revealed, and just when you think you've seen everything the game has to offer, you chance upon some secret area, or piece of lore, or some other genius little detail you completely missed the first, second, or perhaps third time round. When Elden Ring was first released, many people were surprised and delighted at how vast that game was, with its initial presentation fooling you into thinking you had a rough idea of the scope of the game world before gradually realising that your first impression could not have been more wrong. It was a brilliant game design decision which provided a powerful experience for players as their expectations were subverted, leaving them thinking, who knows what this game is going to throw at me next, who knows how deep it goes. As incredible as Elden Ring was though, I'd already had the same feeling a few years previously with Hollow Knight, and only very rarely have I had such an enchantingly enjoyable time with the game, with that enjoyment only growing stronger as I progressed further through its story and world before its dramatic climax. Of course, one of the most mind-blowing aspects of Hollow Knight is how absurdly small the team was, just three dudes from Australia. My position on small game studios is that it's never a valid excuse for making a bad game. We've all seen certain overambitious indie developers who try and make a game way beyond their capabilities. It comes out, it stinks, and people say, hey, what do you want, it's a small studio. Yeah, no, that's not an excuse. And also, a very small development team doesn't automatically make a decent game into a great game either. The single most important element of literally any game is its enjoyability, not its backstory. However, when a studio with just a few employees makes an absolutely outstanding game, then yeah, I do give extra credit there. I'm thinking games like Celeste, Slay the Spire, and yes, Hollow Knight. Games that are so good and pure that it's a marvel that anyone managed to make them, never mind a team of two or three. There really is something about the passion and vision inherent with indie developers that often gets lost with larger development teams. Compare the heart, soul and creativity found in Hollow Knight with any modern Ubisoft game, there is no comparison. 
I won't go any further off-road with the whole can of worms that is modern AAA gaming though because this video is about a good game. So without any further ranting or rambling on that subject, let's prepare to take a closer look at Hollow Knight. As for what to expect from the structure of this video, I'll follow the knight's journey from beginning to end, discussing the story, levels, characters and bosses, as well as providing explanation and analysis of Hollow Knight's various gameplay elements and mechanics along the way. With this being such a vast, dense game though, I'm not looking to cover absolutely everything, and furthermore, I've no doubt there's some stuff I still haven't discovered, even after several playthroughs of the game. Also, the general route I take from beginning to end might not necessarily be the optimal way to get through the game, but if it works, it works, and this is by no means a linear game after all. Lastly, before I finally get on with it, if you enjoy the video, why not drop a like? I think it helps with the algorithm or something, I don't know. And if you really like it and want to stick around for more retrospectives on awesome games in the future, hey, maybe you can even subscribe to the channel. And with all that being said, let's begin our journey down into the vast ruined kingdom that is Hallow Nest. Many echoes of Dark Souls can be detected within Hollow Knight, but perhaps the most significant of these lies in its style of storytelling, because in exactly the same way as I've never finished a FromSoft game for the first time with even the slightest idea or understanding of what the hell the story was all about, the exact same was true of Hollow Knight, at least for me. However, there is a story here, and a remarkably strong one which only gets more powerful and compelling as your understanding of it grows. The style of storytelling with most games or even TV and movies is to provide you with information as they progress, increasing your knowledge and understanding of the plot bit by bit as more information is provided via dialogue and on-screen events. But for Hollow Knight, my comprehension of the story didn't increase in the same manner. Instead, I started off with my understanding of the world nearly in a deficit, with the opening elegy by Monomon the teacher being largely meaningless without the proper context with the following scene of a chained figure erupting out in an orange miasma within a sealed black egg holding even less initial meaning. Of course, there is massive significance held in just this first 50 seconds of the game, but it's not there for you to immediately take in and understand. It's there so that later on in the game, or even on a subsequent playthrough, dialogue and events from earlier suddenly click into place as the game's hidden story takes form. Just like with Dark Souls though, and I'll try not to make an excessive number of callbacks to Dark Souls throughout the video, you can easily spend 20 to 30 hours on a playthrough of Hollow Knight without a single care for its story and still have an amazing time, because even without a clear or even vague understanding of its world, the game's deep atmosphere and undeniable charm alone are sufficient enough to provide a powerful and even emotional gaming experience, flavouring the rock solid gameplay base. The game begins with our character, who I'll simply refer to as the Knight from here on, heading towards some distant illuminated location, though at this point it's not clear where we're coming from, why we're heading there, or even who we are. This is the game's tutorial area, introducing us to the most basic of enemies and obstacles. The core movement and combat, as experienced here in the tutorial and in the early game areas, all feel fine, though the speed at which the Knight can move and the height of its jumps did feel a little jarring to me back on my ill-fated first foray into the game. In fact, that might have even been one of the aspects of it that deterred me from pushing through the first hour, because as well as the cartoony graphical style, I do remember thinking the movement in combat felt a bit too light and floaty. However, I'm also on record for thinking that Dark Souls felt too slow and clunky when I first played that game, so I guess I'm just prone to highly inaccurate first impressions of games. But the mobility in Hollow Knight is one of the best things about it particularly when new movement abilities start to get unlocked through the game. It's actually pretty jarring starting up a new playthrough after just finishing a previous one though, because there's a big difference in the way you traverse through levels towards the end of the game compared to your movement at the beginning of a playthrough. Nonetheless, for me, this feeling only lasted about 10 minutes before I adjusted back to only being capable of the most basic movement options of running and jumping. Even though, from the get-go, you can still make use of less obvious techniques, such as pogoing over spikes. Similarly, combat is also very basic at the start, though it feels far less jarring going back to the basics here, because although additional combat options are unlocked through the game, the one basic nail slash really is the bread and butter of Hollow Knight's combat from beginning to end. 
A very distinctive aspect of it that while easy to overlook plays a massive part in the combat's overall feel is the self knockback after each attack. In most games such as, I don't know, Dark Souls? For any Metroidvania, when you attack, your character will typically either advance forward or remain in the same position, sometimes necessitating readjustments to positioning so as to maintain a favourable range to the enemy. In Hollow Knight though, you get knocked back by attacking, very appropriate too considering the small stature of the knight. Thus, if you just keep attacking in this game, you will inevitably push yourself out of range and sometimes into an enemy attack from behind or some environmental hazard. Although this unique aspect of combat does make it harder, you do also adjust to it fairly quickly, though there is actually a way to cancel out the knockback entirely later on in the game. The final gameplay element introduced in the tutorial is the knight's ability to focus souls, restoring a point of health each time by using up a portion of the contents of your soul vessel in the top left, which is gradually refilled by striking enemies with the nail. And this mechanic has a massive impact on the way the game is played, a good impact. They could have gone for something similar to the Estus flasks where you get your 5-10 to 10 heals after a checkpoint like nearly every other Souls influenced game dev has opted to go for over the last decade, but here you primarily gain the ability to heal by hitting things, meaning that recovery is facilitated by offence. Thus, if you're in the middle of a combat encounter, or especially a boss, you often don't get to heal unless you're bold enough to get in there and start doing some damage first. This is one of the reasons or the basic nail slash will be your most used combat option through the whole game. It's because it's the only combat option that actually builds up soul. At the end of King's Pass, we get a final message before stepping beyond the threshold into our destination. Higher beings, these words are for you alone. Beyond this point, you enter the land of King and Creator. Step across this threshold and obey our laws. Bear witness to the last and only civilization, the Eternal Kingdom, Hallow Nest. The first signs of life we see upon entering Hallow Nest are in a small town on the surface called Dirtmouth. Or is it Dirtmouth? I don't know. There's a chance I pronounce some of the names in Hollow Knight differently to you. Please don't get mad at me. Please don't cancel me. Dirtmouth is, of course, the Firelink Shrine of Hollow Knight. Dirtmouth is, of course, the hub area of Hollow Knight, and it will remain this way throughout the whole game. The town has a population of just one when we first enter it the kindly old elder bug or the mayor, as I used to call him. Then I realised there's no reference to him being a mayor anywhere in the game, and that I just made it up in my head. I didn't go to school. I learned everything I know from my mind. I didn't go to school. I, didn't. I learned everything I need to know from my mind. Regardless, I do think he'd make for an excellent mayor. He's got my vote. Often when we meet other characters down in Hallow Nest, after an introduction, they will migrate up to Dirtmouth, and by the end, you can have yourself a nice wee community here, away from the, as we'll soon see, corruption and chaos down below. In a game like this, which has you traverse many dark, dangerous, and sometimes frightening locations, a friendly place like this to breathe and collect yourself is very important, as well as acting as something of a nexus for other locations. While a couple of vendors do open shop here throughout the game, Dirtmouth isn't really intended to be a place where everything you need is handy and here for you, because some more specialised trademen will stay in their specified locations throughout the kingdom. But I think we've spent long enough on the surface, because whilst the knight has crossed the threshold into Hallow Nest, the true kingdom lies below. In fact, with the exception of the Howling Cliffs and parts of Crystal Peak, the entirety of Hallow Nest lies below Dirtmouth, extending much further down than you might initially assume. The first point of entry into this expansive old kingdom is the Forgotten Crossroads. Although you play through a short tutorial section at King's Pass, the real first area is the Forgotten Crossroads here. Although it's still rather elevated in Hallow Nest compared to many other levels, it's about the closest thing the game has to a central area, being directly connected to seven other levels, though not all are accessible right away. Regardless of its proximity to the surface, the crossroads are crawling with mindless husks of bugs who will attack the knight on sight. See, the Kingdom of Hallow Nest is, or at least was, a very special place, and that's because the bugs found here were fully sentient, with a degree of intelligence, creativity and individuality supposedly not seen anywhere else in the world. The game gives little detail about what actually lies outside of Hallow Nest, though some writing at the Howling Cliffs does read 
these blasted plains stretch never ending, there is no world beyond. Also, as those first words at the kingdom's threshold claim, bear witness to the last and only civilization, the eternal kingdom, Hallownest. This could be interpreted as meaning that everything else in the world is dead, or as is probably more likely, Hallownest is the only place in the world with an actual civilization populated by thinking bugs of different species, interacting, building and thriving, or at least that used to be the way of things here before Hallownest came apart at the seams as we see whilst traversing through the sombre violet gloom of the forgotten crossroads, encountering wandering husks, vacantly pacing back and forth before mindlessly attacking, their intellect now lost in place of the primal insect brutality inherent to their savage souls. Although it's the starting area, it can actually be pretty damn easy to get lost in the crossroads for two main reasons. One, the game gives you zero indication of what you're actually supposed to be doing, where you're going, and why. And two, you have no map, and in this game, you need a map. Of course, that's why it's a very good thing that the game really doesn't take too long to give you a map, though you need to actually find it first, or should I say, hear it, from Cornifer the Cartographer, who will likely be the first character the player encounters down here in Hollow Nest, though there are others in the crossroads also. <laughs> The rather nonsensical yet warm and familiar tune that Cornifer perpetually hums will serve as an auditory beacon for the remainder of the game, allowing for the purchase of a rudimentary map of the level which can be further filled out with detail after the purchase of a quill from Cornifer's long-suffering wife back in Dartmouth, who's voiced by the real-life wife of William Pellin, one of the devs. Ah, <sighs> Panada. Your map is everything in Hollow Knight. I have around 90 hours in this game, and counting, but even so, for most areas if you take my map away from me, my precious map, I've immediately lost all orientation. And that's extra true for any new player, especially if they're in a new level, and especially if that new level happens to be the bloody deep nest. Thus, the relief and satisfaction from coming across Cornifer when out in some weird and wonderful new level is massive because although many of the bugs we meet and fight in the world have been anthropomorphised to some degree, or at least humanised through their personalities, environment and backstories, we are still exploring a deep, sprawling network of insect habitats, and without the aid of a map, you can get very, very lost. Getting lost could even be described as being part of the fun though, and indeed, even if you do get a bit off track, it's never pointless. There's always something to collect, see and or do, wherever you happen to roam, either deliberately or by accident. But when you do get seemingly hopelessly lost in the crawling chaos of the deep nest, or the mechanical madness of Crystal Peak, or amongst the elegant architecture of the City of Tears, the sound of Condifer's silly song as you enter a new room is a welcoming sound indeed, as the sometimes frustrating confusion associated with getting lost in some new level is washed away in a wave of warm satisfaction when you sit at the nearest bench and see a representation of your progress and efforts take form on the map, and now every time you go back to that level, you're going to be that much better at navigating through it. Speaking of direction and orientation, though you can choose to navigate through the world solely with the aid of a map, for most folk the wayward compass is also a must, adding a wee icon on the map so you know where you actually are in relation to it, and being your first introduction to the world of charms, accessories for strengthening, enhancing, or generally modifying the attributes of the knight for the purposes of both combat and exploration. Even if you do get really lost in the Forgotten Crossroads, it's unlikely to be for too long, because you can't quite go off and explore the whole world right from the start. With this being a metroidvania, many areas are locked off, not by doors but by simply not being accessible yet due to the knight's limited options for mobility at the start of the game. And so, even if you do get kinda lost at the start, at some point you will end up in the right direction by process of elimination, or just give up and denounce Hollow Knight as a foolish game for infants. With the crossroads being the starting area, it's only right that we get a starting boss, and that boss comes in the form of the False Knight, introducing the player to their first actual challenge. Most of the enemies in the area go down in just two or three hits, with most having just two or in most cases one actual attack, and so while you can and most likely will take damage whilst fighting your smaller bugs in the crossroads, no individual enemy poses a real challenge. There's not even a crucial need to learn enemy attacks yet, 
either due to the ease with which damage can be healed up with soul, after a few whacks with a nail on some dumb crawled, wandering husk, or unsuspecting vengefly. That will change by the way, trust me, there are an absurd variety of enemies in Hollow Knight, and while most will continue to have just one or two attacks each, there are some enemies which will give you nightmares. But things are nice and easy just now, tricking you into thinking the game is going to be a piece of piss, before later spending several days dying in the trial of the fool at the Colosseum before you realise that your initial impressions were erroneous. The False Knight is in my view a great first boss, because while it's absolutely strong enough to cause a death or two, its moveset really isn't complex at all, and it's also very slow, and no wonder, because despite the imposing armour and heavy mess, the real foe here is merely a feeble maggot playing as a lord, dropping the city crest upon death. Although it was completely lost on me at my first playthrough, this isn't just some random big enemy that Team Cherry threw in for a formidable first boss, but rather it has real lore significance, the armour in particular. Although the maggot housed itself within the armour in an attempt to utilise the strength within, this armour actually belonged to an absent character named Hegemol, one of the five great knights of Hallownest. Though we don't ever see Hegemol himself throughout the game, we do see his likeness in the form of a statue guarding the way to the City of Tears a good bit into the game, with the entrance only opening after slotting in the same city crest we got for beating the False Knight. The city crest itself isn't needed until a good bit later though, and to be honest, on my first playthrough I forgot I'd even picked it up by the time I reached the statue of Hegemol outside the city. But beyond the false knight arena waits the first of the game's snail shaman, who teaches the knight their first spell, at least after locking us within his temple until we slay the armoured beast lurking deeper within. Like I said earlier, the core of Hollow Knight's combat is the basic nail slash, but additional options are gradually unlocked through the game but really not that many. In fact, as far as the spells go, there are just three types, each of which can be upgraded a single time, enhancing their power and area of effect. They can be massively powerful and an absolute asset for certain tougher areas and bosses, especially if you design a build around them with a strong charm setup. But apart from just a few occasions in the game, such as when fighting these armoured enemies, you can ignore magic altogether if you really want, and even if you do want to focus on magic, the nail is going to be the thing that will facilitate its usage with its unique ability to build soul, slash by slash. The reason the snail had to be visited for his shamanic insights is because the path to the next level is blocked by an elder boulder, one of the few enemies in the game which is immune to hits from the nail, but vulnerable to magic. This is one of the biggest strengths of magic, as well as its obvious range. It can penetrate through enemies, and through shields, and this will come in very handy for some later, larger bugs which are prone to blocking damage. Before progressing on to the newly accessible level, there's a certain ominous curiosity sitting very close to the surface, and lying just to the east of the entrance into the forgotten crossroads from Dirtmouth, and that is the Temple of the Black Egg. The reason I mention the temple's proximity to the starting levels is that it itself is the site of the game's final battle, but we're a long way from that for now. Of course, the sealed door here is also the one seen back in the opening cutscene, which also showed a chained, howling figure locked away behind the door, and thus there's a quiet, threatening atmosphere here, especially as the door or seals cannot yet be interacted with. The presence of Quirrell here does lighten the mood somewhat though, there to incite the player's curiosity of what really lies within the egg and what other mysteries might lie deeper within Hallownest. Like some other characters, Quirrell will appear in key locations throughout our journey, often providing some friendly commentary or insight, and making the player's journey that bit more pleasant. Furthermore, although it's anything but obvious at this point, Quirrell and his mask will play a key role in the fate of Hallownest further into the game. Finally though, the next level can be entered, lying just to the west of the crossroads, and that area is Green Path, with its bright, bouncing soundtrack. As great as this track is, and as much as I know it's a lot of people's favourites, like yours Danny, if you're listening, it's not quite one of my favourites. The track which plays at Crystal Peak is probably the tops for me, or maybe the resting grounds theme. The role of Christopher Larkin's soundtrack in this game cannot be understated though, complementing each level's distinctive colour palette and design with his soulful compositions, from the crystalline tones which accompany the player as they ascend Crystal Peak, to the bright but sombre pipes accompanying the descent down Kingdom's Edge. 
but we are a while away from those strange distant places, still being at the stage in the game where the environments are somewhat familiar, or at least relatively familiar, considering everyone's a bug. Green Path is certainly the lushest and greenest level in the game, being a verdant path of vegetation and moss, though often with the presence of caustic pools of acid bubbling and fuming from the base, there to punish the player for an ill-considered jump or as a follow-up slap in the face after getting hit by an enemy for one bit of damage only to immediately take another bit of damage after landing in the acid or spikes or god knows what else. Speaking from my experiences of taking damage in general throughout Hollow Knight, most of the time when I got hit by an environmental hazard, it's cause I was being sloppy, rather than the environment actually being difficult to reverse. Though for me, the factors which led to this sloppiness is just how fast you can move, both when running and when in mid-air during a jump or fall. I mean, sure you could take things slowly and carefully and be really meticulous in your timings and spacings for every jump, but who the hell wants to do that when you can move so fast? And when the game is so forgiving with taking damage with its healing mechanic, I know it's not the same thing, but I'm kinda reminded of the rally mechanic from Bloodborne, where getting hit sometimes wasn't a big deal, because you could just recover it directly after anyway, often with little to no net negative, and thus, taking damage was to some degree a core part of the experience. The same is true of Hollow Knight. You will take damage, and you can play sloppily, and most of the time it really doesn't matter, because it's so easy to heal up and undo the penalty for sloppy navigation through environmental hazards and from the enemies littered through the different areas, many of which essentially function as moving environmental hazards. Back when first conversing with the elder bug at Dirtmouth, he warns the knight of the sickly air which fills Hollow Nest, turning bugs mad, and this sickly air can be thought of as a miasma of sorts, manifesting as an orange gas or fluid the same kind which splatters off enemies when they're hit, or which explodes out from bosses upon their defeat. In many cases you can even see the telltale orange hue in the eyes of enemies, such as with the wandering and leaping husks in the Forgotten Crossroads, and unfortunately, despite Green Pass rather bright and welcoming appearance, the infection is present here too, amongst the mosskin native to the level. The volatile mosskin will even send out a puff cloud of infection gas if you get too close, and even the former noble protectors of Green Path, the Moss Knights, have given in to the infection, though still retaining their skill for combat. As with nearly every area in the game, you'll come across scraps of lore, often hidden away and containing just a line or two of really straightforward text. But one such piece of lore reads, The greater mind once dreamed of leaf and stone, and cast these caverns so. In every bush and every vine, the mind of Un reveals itself to us. Now, although this doesn't mean much when you first read it, the words here are actually more literal than they first seem, and in fact, Un is a real figure in the game, and present right here in Green Path. Although his lair is totally accessible until a good bit into the game, Un can be visited, and this giant slug-like creature is, or was, something of a god to the inhabitants of Green Path. When you first arrive in the Lake of Un to the far west of the level, there's an infected moss knight just staring off into the distance across the lake. But it's not till way later that you realise it was literally gazing towards the home of the god or higher being supposedly responsible for the design and creation of Green Path. Traversing further westward through Green Path, we see the occasional glimpse of some elusive red-robed figure, jumping or darting out of sight before the knight can come within reach and following this figure does in fact lead to the main boss of the level, and our reason for coming here in the first place. Before that though, there are a couple of key characters to meet in the level, one frightening and the other foolish. As you approach the hunter's lair, everything about this place makes you think that gates or vines are going to drop down at either side of the arena, leading to a boss fight with some sinister six-eyed shadow lurker, but no. Expectations are subverted as the hunter instead gifts us with a hunter's journal, serving as a bestiary of sorts, which will automatically populate with tantalising tidbits of intel on the game's many, many enemies and bosses, with an initial journey entry appearing after the first kill, then a further entry appearing after achieving the corresponding kill count for that enemy. Although you fill out the vast majority of journal entries, just by making your way through the game and exploring thoroughly, there were still a few outstanding monsters to hunt down towards the end to complete my collection, a few of which I didn't even know could be killed in the first place, like the Durandas and the Crystal Crawler. 
Just as your expectations are subverted when you first come here, the game plays the exact same trick at the end when you return here with a complete journal. Bravo Team Cherry, bravo, you got me. As well as the Hunter's Journal, another goal to work towards through the game is to seek out hidden grubs for the grub father back in the Forgotten Crossroads. There are 46 of these cute wee critters hidden throughout Hollow Nest, and for each one found the grub father will shower the player with geo, or even special charms or items after certain milestones are met. The placement of these grubs can be quite fiendish, and although the ones you'll see nearer the start of the game typically won't be too difficult to reach, in later levels they can be very tough to get to, and that's if you even find them in the first place, though just as Cornifer has his silly song, the grubs have their signature whimper, giving the player some indication of how close they are based on the volume, though even just the knowledge that there's a grub in the area at all is half the battle, because once you hear that noise, it's just a case of looking very closely at every wall to determine if it's breakable, or walking into every corner to assess whether it can actually be walked through. Finding the grubs is completely optional, but it's in the player's best interest to get them all, or at least most of them for the rewards, and also it serves as an additional way to test your skill and investigation skills. The grubs are kinda like the strawberries from Celeste. You can go right past them and concentrate on the main objective, or you can put in an extra bit of time and effort and go for them. Speaking of breakable walls and such, a core element of Hollow Knight's level design is deception. There's the way a level appears when you first enter it, then there's its true form after every nook, cranny, crevice or other miscellaneous illusion has been shattered. What the hell even is a cranny? Ah. Sometimes it will be fairly obvious that there's more to a section of the level than it seems, though other times it couldn't be less obvious, and this can get quite annoying. For example, later on in a place called King's Station, much further to the southeast, there's what looks like a solid impenetrable wall here, ending in what looks like a solid barrier judging by the map, making me think, ah oh well, I can go no further, except you just can. You can swim right through here, leading to a whole other level. On the one hand, it's really cool to have secret passages hidden throughout the world, but on the other hand, they can sometimes be a bit too hidden, which can be frustrating if you're desperately trying to get somewhere and think you've explored thoroughly, only to realise you were actually meant to walk into a wall somewhere. Honestly though, I'm kind of reaching for a gripe here, because if there's a secret area, there will almost always be some sort of indication, however subtle, that I can be broken or passed through. In my videos, I do try and provide criticism from time to time, even to games I love, because no game is perfect, not even my precious Bloodborne, and informed critique can make for interesting and engaging discussion. That said, I do not at all see myself as a critic, because my number one goal with this channel is to simply make fun videos about great games. Not to try my hardest to pick up on every minor flaw in a game, even ones which have little to no bearing on the game's enjoyability. Back to my point about reaching for a gripe though, I say that because I really don't have many negative things to say about Hollow Knight. That's not to suggest that it's a perfect game, because it's not, and I know others have highlighted issues they've experienced, such as the pacing, but those aren't issues I've had with the game, and so I really don't give a shit. I kinda wish I did have at least a few critiques though, so that people don't think I'm just here to gush about the game in a two and a half hour long session of over-enthusiastic, evangelical fervour, but often when I'd come to a part that I find myself getting annoyed at, I'd stop and think about it for a minute, and usually I'd realise there'd be a good game design decision for the object, enemy or aspect that I got annoyed at in the first place, and Hollow Knight really is a damned masterclass in game design. Not that I have a degree in game design or development, or that I have any credentials whatsoever in that regard, but as a seasoned gamer of advanced years, I think I have a sufficient level of competency at this point to tell good game design apart from bad. Before heading to the boss of Greenpath, there's one final character of… significance. One in a state of duress, 
at the upper, more cavernous section of the level, and that character is Zote. Zote? Zote. Trapped within the pincer-like maw of a Vengefly King, serving as a nice wee optional mini-boss. Like almost every character in this game, Zote is dripping with personality, with his surly, cocksure attitude being complimented hilariously by, by the dismissive sounds coming from his weird mouth, head jiggling back and forth all the way. Like Quirrell, Zote will turn up in all sorts of places, often serving as a source of comic relief, always clearly being out of his depth but in complete overconfident denial the whole time. There are some great moments with this character, but the best is at the very end. We'll discuss the 57 precepts of Zote in more detail further on in the video. To the west of Greenpath, just a bit before the Lake of Un, in an arena overshadowed by several carved monoliths of ambiguous significance, we meet Hornet, who reacts in a hostile manner to the knight, though we as players can't know why at this point. She does reference a terrible thing awakening in Hallownest though, a clear connection to the thing within the Temple of the Black Egg we saw in the opening cutscene, the thing which seemed to be what summoned the knight to Hallownest in the first place. Like the false knight, Hornet isn't really a hard boss, but based on what the player has fought previously, she can certainly be a challenge. And also, compared to the limited, lumbering mobility of the false knight, Hornet has a very similar level of mobility to the knight. But one, instead of just cycling through two or three attacks, she can actually move around the arena and reposition herself, requiring more involved repositioning by the player themselves. Although she can be a bit tricky for newer players, one mercy is that she can be stunned after a certain level of damage is dealt, and this will continue to be the case for most future bosses, offering brief respite for healing or even extra damage, though the length of that respite does vary from boss to boss. Though she does zip off without a word after defeat, Hornet will of course reappear several times more through the game and is a key character in its story. And she's also the only story boss in the game that you fight twice, although technically the second encounter is optional. Really great design though, and just so cute, and as a grown man it pains me to say that, but nonetheless, lots of the bug designs in Hollow Knight just make me smile, especially coupled with the hilarious gibberish noises they make whilst engaged in some charming animation coupled with equally charming dialogue. It's one thing to make one of the best metroidvanias of all time in terms of game mechanics, but the Team Cherry graced all that mechanical brilliance with its brand of magical charm really is the cherry on top. Although the encounter with Hornet is a key event in the story, of greater significance from a gameplay standpoint is that we finally get access to the dash, from the corpse of a being that looks alarmingly similar to the knight no less. Now, while the player already had pretty excellent mobility in terms of speed and control before this, the dash makes a massive difference, and as well as providing an enhancement to the speed at which the environment can be traversed by spamming the dash button as you run, access is now granted to certain areas which were previously out of reach, now reachable via a jump followed by an air dash. I guess it's that classic, satisfying characteristic of Metroidvanias, where you see a treasure or transition which seems impossible to get to, and then you progress through the game and gain some new ability and remember that part from before which can now be explored and checked off. It's very rewarding just to fill out parts of the map in this game. You do have the option to add custom markers to points on the map to be returned to later on, but generally what I did was either just use my memory, which isn't very good to be honest, or just look out for wee incomplete parts of the map after getting a new ability to see if it's now reachable. As I mentioned earlier, Dirtmouth is a good place to return and touch base every now and then, to buy stuff, or just to listen to the idle ramblings of the mayor. And fortunately, instead of having to climb back up to the surface every time, a task which would be both inconvenient and arduous from the deeper parts of Hollow Nest, there is a transit system of sorts in the form of the stag stations, dotted at key locations around Hollow Nest, such as in Greenpath and Dirtmouth, and they allow for quick passage throughout the kingdom. As with everything in this game, even the fast travel system has its own degree of charm thanks to the gruff but hard working nature of the stag, though there's also a melancholy element to this character, who is apparently the last of its kind left in Hollow Nest, as evidenced by the corpses of its co-workers which litter the forgotten stag den. Melancholy is an accurate adjective for a lot of Hollow Knight's levels, because while some are very much now devoid of any surviving intelligence or elegance, 
Others still retain their sophistication and beauty, leaving behind forlorn echoes of a golden age. Accessible directly from the south of Greenpath is a new area known as Fog Canyon, possibly the most alien level in the game, with this otherworldly effect being enhanced by the odd pink hue of the background and the constant bubbling sound effects made by the bizarre jellyfish looking creatures. This is also the first time the player actually sees life forms which don't in any way resemble box too, and really, even though they do resemble jellyfish, these are particularly odd jellyfish. For one, they seem to have first aid kits trapped inside their heads. Although the smaller creatures here, called Uomas, are only vaguely threatening, slowly drifting back and forth and just doing contact damage, the larger ones, called Umas, are way more dangerous, and for me, they were often a peril of my own making, because despite their unique property of turning into a speeding, homing bomb after being struck, dealing two points of damage per hit, I simply cannot resist the urge to hit them as I pass, to my own detriment more often than not. Fog Canyon is one of those areas to be returned to later on though, because some sections are cut off at this point by untraversable hazards, or these strange shadowy gates. We're largely just passing through at this point, because the real destination is a stag station, Queen's Station to be precise, acting as a link between Fog Canyon and the Fungal Wastes. There are a couple of characters to meet though, there's Willow, who's just munching on some delicious treats growing from the roof. For ages, I just thought she was here to look adorable, but no. If you hit her with the dream nail later on, she's actually contemplating eating the night, and furthermore, if you climb up here later after getting the double jump, there's a goddamn corpse being stashed away, and there's something really unsettling about the way Willow sucks on these mushrooms. Not so adorable now, I guess. And speaking of shifty characters, there's a banker of all things, just nearby within the lower section of Fog Canyon, allowing for the storage of up to 4,500 geo. I'm sure it's perfectly safe to store my valuable coinage here, so let's just make a deposit and say no more about it, for now. I guess one of the most direct Dark Souls influences in Hollow Knight is its adaptation of the Bloodstain mechanic, allowing for dropped geo to be reclaimed upon reaching your site of demise. The difference is that instead of a bloodstain, it's a dark shade who will actually fight back, and in rare cases, this really can be a source of great frustration. I mean, the shade is not difficult to kill, but as you learn more spells, it will also learn them, gradually becoming more dangerous as the knight gets more powerful. Even with this though, on its own, a shade really isn't much of a challenge, but if it happens to be situated next to an enemy or two, especially if there's also an environmental hazard nearby, it can get really frustrating. And although I've never been killed by a shade, I can imagine it being absolutely infuriating to die, make it back to where you died, and then die to the shade again and permanently lose all your geo. Hollow Knight isn't quite as extravagant with its distribution of geo either when compared to Dark Souls. One of the most rewarding things about beating a boss in those games is the fat soul reward, but as challenging as Hollow Knight's bosses can get, many of them don't give you any geo at all upon victory, though on the occasions where they do explode in a shower of shells, it is nice. Like I said, Queen Station is the nexus connecting Golf Canyon, Golf Canyon, connecting Fork Canyon to the Fungal Wastes which itself is connected to several other levels, including back the Forgotten Crossroads. Whereas Fog Canyon had a distinct alien aura populated by otherworldly oddities in the form of Umas and Uomas, the Fungal Wastes is equally as odd except more fungal, hence the name. Again, we're faced with creatures which are not in any way bug related, featuring ambulatory mushrooms, big and small. These ones in particular are always a pain in the arse to deal with, though I do love the noise they make. It reminds me of this clip. <laughs> Later on in this level, there's a bizarre character who I completely forgot about before my recent couple of playthroughs, and his name is Mr. Mushroom, with one of the funniest interactions I've ever seen. Just the way he abruptly stops moving, and then slowly turns around when you hit him, as if to say, what the f*** are you doing? By the way, from here on I'm going to try censoring some of my more coarse language in my videos. Being Scottish, I'm prone to a swear or two, and it's probably just not that great for my channel's image, to be honest. Anyway, let's go on with the fucking video. Although Mushroom Charlie just speaks gibberish, if you try and talk to him the same way you would anything else, 
Hitting him with the dream mail later on evokes some rather profound but at this point ambiguous dialogue, though in reality the words worms pull bugs into their throw till ages pass and kingdoms fall is essentially an ultra condensed version of the whole story of Hollow Nest because while there's very little information on him at this point, the worm being referred to here is, or was, the mythical Pale King of Hollow Nest. Around this point, we start seeing these strange signposts which are supposed to signify a city, though when I first played the game, I really didn't know how to interpret this collection of shapes, but regardless, they do point towards a city, the same way other signs throughout the game point to stack stations or benches. While the road to this city in question is at the eastern end of the fungal wastes, all you can do at this point is look at it due to the bridge being retracted and having no way to climb up to the high ledge even with the aid of a dash, and indeed this is another one of those occasions where it's clear you just need to come back later on, with the next destination being deeper within the fungal wastes. New level specific gameplay elements also make an appearance in this level with the inclusion of these bouncy pink mushrooms, giving the level its own unique identity. Every larger level in the game of course has its own theme and colour palette complete with bright, stunning background artwork, breakable objects and new enemies, but I love how Team Cherry went a step further and added additional level specific elements to alter how you even move through those levels, and similar touches are also found in later areas, making the world feel more interesting and varied. At the southeastern corner of the fungal wastes, new enemies start showing up in the form of mantises, which feel completely different to the residents of the fungal jungle further above, requiring more careful consideration of timing and spacing before launching in for an attack. By the way, even though I'll provide nuggets of analysis on some of the game's enemies and bosses from time to time, let me make it clear that I'm not great at this game. In fact, I'm actually a bit shit, and I get hit all the time. Now that we've gotten that out of the way, Let's continue with the program. Although we have entered a new section of the level, it is still a part of the fungal wastes. It's just a more distinct sub-area of it, with its own unique character and backstory. And in fact, Mantis Village is one of the few places in Hollow Nest which managed to resist the infection, largely due to the code of honour inherent to their culture. Thus, the Mantises aren't attacking the night out of madness, but because it's entered their home uninvited and has yet to prove itself. Not far into the village, yet another significant development in our mobility abilities is gained in the form of the Mantis Claw, enabling walls to be attached to and even jumped from. Thus, from this point on, any time you see a vertical wall, no matter how high it is, it can be easily scaled all the way to the top, or jumped from midway up. This is huge and allows for rapid traversal of the environment, as well as facilitating a decent degree of creativity in how the player moves from point A to point B, using walls and gaps as an opportunity for greater speed and exploration, instead of seeing the environment as more of an obstacle, as is more the case at the very start, when all you can really do is run and jump. A nice wee touch with the Mantis Claw that's easy to miss is that it's just a damned claw, and we even take it from a storeroom with a multitude of other claws whereas the other power-ups tend to have a more mystical aspect to them, as opposed to here where the knight just grabs something from a box. Though you can simply return back to the entrance to the city here thanks to our enhanced abilities of traversal, there's also the option to delve a bit deeper into the village for an awesome optional boss in the form of the Mantis Lords. There's actually a good argument for visiting the city first so as to upgrade your nail, just as Quirrell recommends upon meeting him in the fungal wastes, but meh, you don't need that for the Mantis Lords. What are you, a wimp? Like I said, this boss is totally optional, and in fact, the fight doesn't even start until you directly challenge them, again making it clear that the Mantises have retained their sanity and honour despite the decay throughout the rest of the kingdom. This fight's more about timing than anything else, and keeping a good rhythm going as you read the rather easily dodgeable attacks, though the difficulty does get quite literally doubled up in Phase 2 after the First Lord is defeated. When I took damage here, it was usually because I fell out of sync with the boss, but this fight can get pretty intense towards the end, especially if you're working with an old nail as I was. A touch I absolutely love here is that unlike the majority of bosses we face, we don't actually kill the lords. In fact, this battle was merely a test of strength, one which the knight, and by extension the player, passes, hence why they bow and allow passage through their village. However, if you contain the intense anticipation of delving into the wriggling hell that is the deep nest and ascend back up into the village, 
Every Mantis also bows to you, becoming totally non-hostile now that your strength has been proved. Before departing from the fungal wastes, as is often the case, there's another key character here, and just as Zote needed saving from his situation, there's a frightened wee beetle here, stranded beyond a pretty freaking formidable section of spiked walls. Thank heavens we have the Mantis Claw. An easily missable detail with Bretta here is that before approaching her, you can actually see the infection taking its influence over her, as represented by the orange haze on her head, though the knight's interruption prevents it from taking proper hold over her, otherwise we'd be obliterating her with both nail and magic, as we do every other poor sucker throughout the kingdom. Bretta is positively smitten with the knight after this daring rescue, and will migrate back to Dirtmouth where she takes up residence in one of the houses. It's well worth doing this too because we get a mask fragment for our troubles, and also her story ties in with Zote later on, in hilarious fashion. Now, you can progress through to Deep Nest at this point in the game, but in my experience probably best not to yet, and in fact, Cornifer even warns against trying to brave your way through it at this point. Nonetheless, it is still somewhat manageable, but very dark and intimidating. It's tough even if you do get the map from Cornifer, but if you miss him here, the deep nest absolutely sucks, and it is so easy to get lost in. The worst is dying in this place, because it really is a damn maze, with one section often looking very similar to another, and so trying to locate your shade without the aid of a map is a lesson in frustration. Just as the previous areas have their own quirks and characteristics, which make them fun and unique, so too does the Deep Nest, minus the fun part, with the main feature of this location being its dark and constricted nature. It's certainly not the darkest area in the game, because certain parts of the world actually require the help of a lantern to traverse, but your visibility here, while sufficient, is also inconvenient. As difficult as some enemies might be to dodge and defeat in other levels, the Deep Nest is one of the only places in the game to spawn enemies right out of the ground as you're walking through some new tight tunnel in dark desperation towards finding the bloody exit, and this really is one of those levels where rather than sticking around for a while to take in the vibes, scenery and music, I'm more interested in doing whatever the hell it is I'm here to do and then leave. That's not to say that it's a bad area though, because it's not, it's just rather oppressive and impersonal, and this is certainly aided in large part by the constant sounds of insects crawling, scuttling and wriggling in the deep darkness, and you can even see these insects in some places, showing that for as chaotic and violent as the rest of Hollow Nest is, this place is on another level. Although you don't need to come to Deep Nest yet, there is one peel of interest at its slightly less wild upper level in the form of the failed tramway. As well as your stag stations, there are also several tramways throughout Hollow Nest which add an additional means of traversal throughout the world, sometimes allowing access to a level you haven't even entered yet, whilst the world's stag stations only activate in locations you've already been to. As suggested by its name, this tramway further into Deep Nest, perhaps intended to provide passage between here and the fungal wastes and the City of Tears, did not work out, most likely due to strange relations between the King of Hollow Nest and the inhabitants of the Deep Nest. In fact, using the Dream Nail on the dead workers here reveals the folly of trying to build modern infrastructure so far into the Deep Nest, though they did manage to build another one at its eastern boundary further away from the chaos deeper within. Regardless of this failure, there is the tram pass lying here, allowing for the use of Hollow Nest forgotten tramways, and I later found myself using one particular tram line a bunch in regard to one particular side quest. The real destination, however, is of course Hollow Nest's heart, the City of Tears, finally accessible with the help of the Mantis Claw, and after slotting the City Crest from the False Knight into the Statue of Hegemol. Whereas the Forgotten Crossroads has fallen into disused dereliction, and the landscapes of Green Path and the Fungal Wastes have grown largely untamed and unrefined through the ages since Hollow Nest's bleak collapse, the City of Tears is a different affair entirely. In fact, the environment here is so sophisticated that it would not look at all out of place in many other games, having recognisable architectural aspects and even a drainage system. Environmental conditions and features tend to be more wild than the outer regions of the kingdom, but at its heart, some degree of noble elegance still remains, and this is certainly one of the game's most beautiful and enjoyable levels to traverse. Many other levels are visually captivating in their own right, like the Hive and Crystal Peak, but in a very different way to the City of Tears. 
This locale's namesake does of course come from the continuous stream of raindrops from above, but bear in mind that we are underground and out of reach of any actual precipitation from clouds. If you talk with Quirrell, who's chilling by the window, admiring the view, he will muse on the rain's origins, and indeed, later on in the resting grounds level, there's a large body of water called the Blue Lake, situated directly over the city, serving as the source of its so-called tears. Not every character is as enchanted with the rain as Quirrell, though. As sophisticated as the city is, it's no less dangerous than anywhere else in the game, with an even greater concentration of infected bugs here, though like the Moth Knights from Greenpath, the sentries of the City of Tears have retained their former discipline and fighting prowess, carrying on their old patrols and defending the city from intruders, well-meaning or otherwise. Along the lower level of the city, a giant fountain can be found where we once again meet Hornet, though thankfully she's much friendlier this time round. Like I said near the start of the video, a lot of the game's key events and even dialogue really didn't mean much to me the first time I heard them, because everything's still a mystery and you just don't yet have proper context for what's happening or why the night is even here. This is all purposeful though, especially the lack of direction. It's clear that the developers intended for the player to just get lost sometimes, rather than always being on the critical path, making beelines to the next clearly marked objective. Though in saying that, the game does actually give more guidance towards key destinations from around the halfway point of the game, but through the first half, a lot of it can involve just scrambling around the accessible portion of the world trying to work out where the game wants you to go next, accumulating geo, meeting characters and activating stack stations along the way as you slowly start to make some sort of sense of the world, both its physical layout and its history. Hornet says that in reaching the heart of the world, we'll know the sacrifice which keeps it standing, and indeed, this scene's placement directly in front of the statue of a large imposing knight is no coincidence, because as we later learn, this knight is the literal sacrifice referenced by Hornet, and the only thing keeping the infection from completely spilling over. The Black Vault the text mentions here is of course the Temple of the Black Egg within the Forgotten Crossroads, though the conclusion that Hallownest stands eternal is far more dubious considering the current state of the kingdom. For me, upon reaching the City of Tears, the number one thing I wanted to do was get my damn nail upgraded, pronto, and indeed, as indicated by the rather creative signpost at the west of the city, the nailsmith's smoky workshop lies further west still. How great is the design of this freaking building by the way, I love it. Nail upgrades are largely a straightforward affair here, simply providing a damage buff, nice and simple. The damage increases really are substantial too, especially the first one which makes the nail 90% stronger compared to its basic form, then 45% stronger from form 2 to form 3 and so on. Though no additional functionality is added to your weapon here, the actual appearance of the nail does change in the menu, which is a nice wee touch, all the way from the old nail to its final form, the pure nail. The first upgrade merely costs a modest sum of geo, though every upgrade after that needs a bunch more geo and varying amounts of a very elusive item known as Pale Ore, so sadly there's no early grinding up for geo and getting a maxed out nail or anything. It is a great feeling returning back to an enemy which used to take two swings from the nail and then dispatching them with ease with but a single swing. And once you get the pure nail, nothing from the earlier levels will give you much trouble and it's great fun returning back to Green Path or the Fungal Wastes late game and just blazing through it like it's nothing. And progression is something Hollow Knight does extraordinarily well. Upgrades never feel minor in this game, you're not getting a 3% extra damage here or a plus 10% resistance to poison, the upgrades you receive always feel significant, both the combat oriented ones and those related to mobility. Handily, there's a neat shortcut linking the City of Tears directly to the Forgotten Crossroads, providing access to one of the easiest bosses in the game, the Gruz Mother, as well as another couple of characters, one of which is hidden away in a hut and suffering the same mental malady as Bretta before we stop the infection from taking hold. Although Sly here just appears to be a harmless but friendly dude, even setting up shop in Dubmouth after his rescue, you later learn that there's more to him than meets the eye, and turns out he's more formidable than he looks. There's also Salubra in her secluded hut, who is one of those characters I can't look at or listen to without laughing. <laughs> Mariba Oso. 
It's common knowledge by now that almost all of the voice acting in Hollow Knight was done by the devs themselves or their family members, and indeed it was William Pellin who did the noises for Salubra. She sells some really powerful charms as well as additional charm notches throughout the game, and if you're a really diligent charm hunter, she even bestows a special blessing upon you. Back in the city of Tears though, I imagine there will be a fair amount of variation from player to player regarding which direction to go from here, but for me, I always hit up Soul Sanctum higher up in the city, though you can always take a dank dip in the royal waterways and maybe even take on the Fluke Marn, though if you suck at the game as I do, I wouldn't quite recommend this course of action just yet. Taking on this, whatever the hell this even is, early was about the closest I came to losing it on my most recent playthrough. If you can take out its flukes in one hit with your nail, it's barely difficult at all, but you won't find yourself with that capability until the nail has been upgraded at least twice, requiring a pale ore which is very difficult to obtain at this point in the game, and so I straight up have to just give up after a few tries and come back later. Humiliating. Also, at one point I literally lost over 3,500 geo after dying during the run back to the boss arena, but it's okay because I didn't even get mad at all. A somewhat more manageable location for now is Soul Sanctum, what a cool freaking name for an area, though it is still technically part of the City of Tears, much like Mantis Village was still part of the Fungal Wastes. The inclusion of the word soul is very significant here though, and this is one of the very few cases where we see enemies also using magic on us and straight up flying round. The idea of this upper sanctum was to harness the power of the soul to attain a pure focus towards achieving immortality. Research and experimentation into soul power was also intensified when the infection started to run rampant throughout the kingdom, but as we see by the aggressive nature of the soul twisters and soul warriors throughout the sanctum, and by the familiar sickly orange hue in their eyes, these experiments were clearly not a success, though the folly and mistake enemies slithering round serve as even more grotesque testaments to the sins of the scholars of soul sanctum. It's a pretty damn disturbing place if you think about it, perfectly complemented by those dark dramatic organs of the soundtrack. There is a good reason for coming here though, and that's to take on the head scholar of the sanctum, the Soul Master, who makes one of the most delightfully dramatic boss entrances I have ever seen, rising up ominously from the background then teleporting into the foreground. I performed like absolute garbage in this fight, and it is kinda tricky, but not that bad. Before I started making videos last year, I'd never had any reason to record general gameplay footage, and so once I was done with a play session, that was that. But now that I record so much, sometimes when I look back on my in-game performances on bosses and such, I'm disgusted at myself. Not really though, I actually don't give a fuck. Whoops, sorry. I actually don't give a f There's a great fake out here when you think you've won the fight before the game kicks you in the nuts and says no. Funny wee flourishes like this happen a lot in Hollow Knight's boss fights, and it does a lot to keep the combat feeling fresh, exciting and challenging from start to end, and just gives everything that extra bit of charm and personality. The reward for victory for this fight is a new spell, Desolate Dive, allowing for a powerful slam into the ground. Now, of the three spell types, the Desolate Dive was definitely the one I used the least in combat, with the Vengeful Spirit being way more practical, or at least that's the way it seems to me. Maybe I'm wrong. However, Desolate Dive is unique amongst the three spells in that it allows for access into new areas, being capable of breaking through shaky, fragile ground so as to explore what lies beneath, but its Vengeful Spirit and Howling Wraiths are purely combat based. There happens to be a very important level which is now fully traversable thanks to Desolate Dive, and that level is the Crystal Peak. You can actually go in there early on and get a brief taste of the place, but it's another one of those cases where you can't actually penetrate into it without the prerequisite ability, which we now have. Crystal Peak really might be my favourite level in the game, though there's some stiff competition there for sure, so it's entirely possible that the words, this is my favourite level in the game, might come up again later for a completely different level. I just like the levels, okay? The Crystal Peaks are where these distinctive pink crystals were mined, processed and transported to the rest of the kingdom due to the power or energy contained within them. 
This place kind of reminds me of Stonefang Tunnel from Demon's Souls, not because they look in any way similar, because they don't, but because even though afflicted with the infection, the miners down here continue working away, and even the conveyor belts and machines are still fully functional after who knows how long, presumably having been maintained over the years by the miners, leading to the profusion of pink crystal littered throughout the tunnels. As well as the contact damage inherent with all in-game enemies, a unique new hazard appears here in the form of lasers, adding an additional element of difficulty when climbing higher up the peak, as well as having to watch out for spikes and even hammers. Lasers come even more into play with the first boss of the level though, the Crystal Guardian who's just minding his business on the bench before we try and invade his personal space, Rude. It's a fairly conventional boss and is one of the rare cases where you actually get a fat Geo reward after victory, but the cool thing about it is the way it escapes upwards after defeat and indeed if you return to the Crystal Peaks later on after getting the Monarch Wings from the Ancient Basin, the Enraged Guardian can be thought being about twice as difficult and doing 2 points of damage per hit, which is always rough. Though ascending to the top of Crystal Peak does net you a pale ore, situated next to a very mysterious, yet very significant, winged statue. Although there's plenty to see and do in Crystal Peak, a very important item lies to the east, within the bizarre corpse of some rotund ancient machine insect, the Crystal Heart which even has a strong audio-visual pulse which increases in intensity as the night gets closer to it. Of course, we just unlocked another mobility option, allowing for a long-ranged super dash which will straight up continue forever until an obstacle gets in the way. Although this ability certainly is cool and can help to some degree with general traversal, it's far more situational than the dash or mantis claw in that the places where you're likely to use it most are sections of levels where it's required to progress further, rather than the universal applicability of the dash or double jump. Don't get me wrong though, it definitely comes into play a decent amount through the game and in some challenging ways too, particularly in the Queen's Gardens and the White Palace. It's really fun to use too and it's for sure the most anime of all the movement abilities. As far as I know, the longest uninterrupted crystal dash is from Crystal Peak to King's Pass, though it's also very deflating when your flight is interrupted by some insignificant obstacle, like this small mound near the entrance to Green Path. Screw you, mound. Several previously inaccessible areas of Hollow Nest can now be reached thanks to the Crystal Heart, including right here in the Crystal Peaks, where a handy dandy elevator to... Handy dandy. Ugh where a handy elevator to Dartmouth can be activated, even further increasing the world's interconnectedness. The stack stations are great as a means of instant travel around Hallow Nest, but even so, sometimes the nearest station might simply be not all that near, and so more conventional shortcuts like this are much appreciated, and plus, there's not even a stack station in the Crystal Peaks. A couple of things I did right after getting the Crystal Heart was to receive the nail art training from two of the game's three nail masters, learning the Great Slash from Sheo in Greenpath, then the Cyclone Slash from Mato in the Howling Cliffs in the northwest corner of the map, and then I later learned the Dash Slash from Oro in Kingdom's Edge. This is the only one of the three who charges you for it. Stingy bastard. And I didn't even have enough money either, so I had to farm for a bit. Annoying. My history with the nail arts is a bit funny, because on my very first playthrough years ago, I tried them out a handful of times, but just didn't think they were very good and that was almost entirely because of how you can't actually move the knight around when charging them up, and in a hectic encounter with multiple enemies or a frantic boss battle against some bothersome bug, that's no bueno. Except, you absolutely can move around when charging your nail for one of these attacks and I'm a dumbass. I think I just assumed you'd need to stay still and so never actually tried moving when charging. When I actually gave the nail arts a proper go, they turned out to be significantly more useful than I'd assumed, with the Great Slash and Dash Slash doing about 2.5 times more damage than a regular hit, whereas the Cyclone Slash can do massive damage if most of the slashes actually connect, though it does leave you a bit more vulnerable than the other two. The actual cooldown in between the Knight's regular attacks is pretty damn short though, and super short if you've got the Quick Slash charm equipped, and so most of the time I just opt for constant attacking if I found myself in a combat situation where an enemy was open, rather than waiting the couple of seconds for a nail art to charge. But they're perfect for charging up once you got a bit of distance from the enemy to then rush in and unleash a powerful slash, especially with the dash slash. 
I used nail arts a decent enough amount, but I felt way more inclined to use them after being honoured by the great nail sage himself, Sly, allowing for much faster nail art charges and only taking up a single charm slot too, meaning that I had it equipped for most of the game. Returning back to Crystal Peak though, the Crystal Heart allows access to the Crystallised Mound, putting us through a gauntlet of, well, Crystal. I feel like I'm using the word Crystal too much and it's losing all meaning. Anyway, at the end of the Crystallised Mound, we see a familiar figure, a snail shaman, just like the one who taught us Vengeful Spirit back in the Forgotten Crossroads except encased in Crystal. I thought this was going to be a case where we hit the Crystal and then the dude breaks free from within and thanks us for rescuing it. Like when you rescue Siegland from the Golden Crystal Golem in Dark Souls, but no. The Crystal here just shatters, destroying the poor snail within, though also getting us an upgrade for the Desolate Dive, changing it to Descending Dark. Like I said before, this was my least favourite of the three spell types, but the upgraded versions are fantastic, doing way more damage, having a much bigger AoE, and all with the same soul cost. Wow! Although this spell upgrade is nice and all, what's of much greater significance is the wide chasm right next to the crystallised mound, leading down into a new level entirely, the resting grounds, though this place can also be accessed from the ancient basin tramway. The resting grounds mark a pretty significant shift in the game, because up until this point there really hasn't been a great deal of actual direction, it's mostly just been a case of exploring and occasionally getting lost, and then you get a new ability somewhere and thus more of the game world becomes accessible, just like in a Resident Evil game where you start out with a very limited explorable area which gradually opens up with each new key found up until the point where you can go wherever you like. I was getting tired of using Dark Souls as a frame of reference, so I thought I'd chuck in a Resident Evil 1 for a change. From a story point of view, the only significant events thus far have been the fight with Hornet and then when you meet her again in the City of Tears, but the scene with the three dreamers within the resting grounds transitions Hollow Knight into a game with a good deal more guidance, even marking the locations of the three dreamers on the map, showing Lurian the Watcher at the top of the City of Tears, Hera the Beast within the spidery depths of Deep Nest, and Monomon the Teacher resting within Fog Canyon, with Monomon of course being the writer of the LG for Hollow Nest at the very start of the game. These three figures, known as the Dreamers, control the seals which prevent access to the Black Vault. Although still alive in a sense, they are in a state of permanent sleep, being hidden away in the Dream Realm and out of reach from within the physical realm. The Dream Realm can be accessed many times for different purposes from this point on in the game, but this is our first introduction to it as the Dreamers spirit the knight off to the Dream Realm in an effort to prevent him from ever breaking the seals and for it to lead them to their dreams. However, a new figure intervenes. I was actually pretty confused about who this golden moth was for a while, and there seems to be a bit of uncertainty around it too on the internet. At first, I actually thought it was the true endgame antagonist, the Radiance, a character I'll cover more later, because it looks like it, whereas some others think it's just some ambiguous golden moth of the Forgotten Tribe, but the most likely explanation seems to be that it's an incarnation of the Seer who we meet directly after. I guess this might seem pretty obvious to a lot of people, but I think it was a little bit more confusing than it needed to be. Before leaving the Dream Realm through the help of the Seer, we get perhaps the most important item in the game, the Dream Nail, allowing the Knight to cleave his way into the Dream Realms of special bugs out in the world, either by interacting with the long dead corpses or just their sleeping forms. This is the only way to access the three Dreamers to break their seals guarding the entrance to the titular Hollow Knight who waits within, the same one from the opening cutscene and the same one immortalised in the large statue in the City of Tears, surrounded by the trio of Dreamers, Lurian, Hera and Monomon. I love a lot of this game's characters, but the Seer is definitely one of my favourites. The noises she makes are hilarious, and I love how you can still hear them if you wait right outside the entrance here. Like I said, the Dream Nail is a very important item with its ability to allow access to the Dreamers, but as well as that, it opens up a ton of optional boss fights, also allowing activation of the Whispering Roots dotted around the Kingdom. 
There's a bunch of them you'll have walked by before this, but hitting them with a dream nail initiates a bit of a localised collectathon throughout the immediate area. Very classical. This is all in aid of accumulating dream essence, a new resource used to get rewards from our new grandmother. One of which is the ability to place a portal anywhere throughout the world to be warped to from any other point. Very handy for when you're out in the middle of nowhere with not a stack station in sight. Of particular interest for me regarding the dream nail is the associated bosses. Prior to getting the dream nail, there are certain features or locations which seem like they should be of some significance but just don't seem to actually do anything, like the statue of Gorb in the Howling Cliffs, or the Horned statue right here in the resting grounds. With the dream nail though, new optional boss fights can be taken on for more dream essence, and there's quite a few of these too. Bosses in Hollow Knight generally aren't super complex. They're often really fun and cleverly designed and sometimes flat out hilarious, I'm looking at you, Dung Defender, but many bosses have just a handful of moves, used to great effect. But the dream fights tend to be even simpler still, though this really isn't a bad thing. These bosses are a bit more gimmicky, usually starting off with the enemy utilising a particular attack, then as it takes more damage, that same attack will become even faster, or additional projectiles get added, like how Zero's flying lances double up in the second phase, or how Markov gains an additional dream shield though other fights essentially start off with one type of attack which persists in its same form the whole way through. These can be very rhythmic too, being a test of holding your nerve and timing your slash as well, like with the Marmu fight, which pretty much involves just bouncing a cute green ball around the arena, then dying, and then getting mad. As well as the encounters found at corpses or statues, there are others too which become available after beating certain bosses, giving you the chance to fight much harder versions of that boss for more dream essence, like the Lost Ken fight after beating the Broken Vessel, or the White Defender after beating the Dung Defender, but these can be really hard, and though you might be able to take them on fairly early, they can be exceedingly tough without sufficient upgrades and a solid charm setup. I am a man who loves bosses though, I just love them, and so I found it pretty thrilling when 7 new optional bosses became available from this point on. And so at this point, things really open up and you're pretty much given free reign of the kingdom, though there are still abilities to unlock and certain areas still closed off to the night for the time being. Everyone's order of doing things is going to be totally different from here, and as well as the three dreamers to journey to, there's a massive amount of optional content too, like the Colosseum, the Queen's Garden, the Hive, more bosses, all the DLC stuff, and more. Hell, even a couple of abilities are totally optional, like Isma's Tear and the Shade Cloak. But despite what I thought until very recently, you don't even need to set foot in the Abyss. The game can be ended just by breaking the three seals and then challenging the whole night within the temple, but to do that without sampling the other wonders and colours of the rest of Hollow Nest would be doing yourself a great disservice, sir. Probably the single most vivid change to Hollow Nest after our encounter with the Dreamers lies in the Forgotten Crossroads, because it is now transformed into the Infected Crossroads, and this is actually the only time in the game where an entire level changes, irreversibly too, with a new, more sickly and disturbing soundtrack compared to the cleaner and more beautiful one from before. It's an extremely striking visual, because while we've seen our fair share of the infection everywhere else in Hollow Nest, it's at a much higher concentration here compared to anywhere else, leaving the Crossroads' previous bugs either mutated or dead. Story-wise, it makes complete sense that this area has been transformed to this extent due to the presence of the Temple of the Black Egg, with the source of the infection being locked away within, but now at the point where it's about to spill out into the rest of the kingdom. This is the reason why the Hollow Knight roared out to the night, or to anyone in the opening cutscene. It's because it knew it could not contain the infection. It was a flawed vessel in need of either replacement or perhaps some other solution. The infected crossroads is quite a bit harder than its former iteration and is now a properly dangerous place. Of course, as your health increases and you gain charms and nail upgrades and whatnot, you get comfortable just breezing through the crossroads any time you need to pass through. But at this point, the game says no. How about everything explodes now? I did find it kind of frustrating to navigate through here at times though, with some room transitions now being sealed off by impenetrable conglomerations of infection, because these aren't marked on the map, and so a few times I'd be making my way from one side of the map to the other and come across one of these, meaning I'd have to take the long way there, which is a bit of a troll. There really are several ways to go now, and while you can just start making your way to a dreamer, my preference is to head to Kingdom's Edge at the far east of the map, past the City of Tears. 
There's a great deal of verticality to this level, with its main central zone essentially being a straight ascent or descent. There are a couple of unique features here too, which are immediately apparent upon entering. 1. As you climb, the corpses of gladiators will fall down heavily onto the floating platforms, having been thrown from the Colosseum of Fools further above. And 2. There's a constant rain of ash falling from above, in contrast to the rain of tears of the city just adjacent. Although she's quite cryptic with it, Hornet did advise the knight to seek the grave in ash, and indeed, Kingdom's Edge is that general location, though the particular spot Hornet refers to is just out of reach at this point. From Kingdom's Edge though, and with the help of a tram pass, a new location is accessible, that being the Ancient Basin, one of the most interesting levels in the game. For a start, it's like all the colour has been drained from here, a visual aspect which I think helps emphasise how ancient the basin really is. Furthermore, this is one of the only levels with no soundtrack, giving it a very grey, lonely feel as you traverse through its desolate depths, dealing with the mindless, crawling shadow creepers along the way. Thankfully, even as still and stilted as the ancient basin is, the familiar humming and scribbling of Cornifer is still present, and it's more welcome than ever. There is a large, imposing door at the base of the basin, featuring what might be a familiar brand, but it's sealed shut for now and leads to a very important level for later on. At the far west of the basin though, past monstrous Molarchs spewing sprays of orange infection, lies the boss of the area, the Broken Vessel. A vessel which looks alarmingly similar to the knight, albeit with differently shaped horns. But more importantly, this vessel is infested with infection, with eyes glowing that familiar sickly orange. See, the game really doesn't tell you who the knight is at all at the beginning. All you know is that it has come to Hallowness from who knows where, right at a pivotal point for the fate of the kingdom, with the infection from within the temple getting ready to utterly spill over into everything. However, at this point, all this talk of vessels and infection kind of start to click as you get more hints and indications about what the nature of the night might be, and what its purpose here might be. Past the boss, we get a new movement ability, which is just as significant as the dash and mantis claw, and that ability is of course the double jump, in the form of the monarch's wings. I like how the game gives these abilities all these fancy names. Congratulations player, you have found the monarch's wings. The what? It's a double jump, you found the double jump. Now, although there are a couple of other pretty significant abilities to be found elsewhere, the Mothwing Cloak, Mantis Claw, Crystal Heart and Monarch Wings are all that is actually required to reach all mandatory areas and achieve an ending. I don't think I need to go into too much detail about the utility of the double jump in this game, because yeah, it's a double jump. It's great. It's interesting that it gives you it so late though, because in most games that feature a double jump, it tends to be awarded quite early on to be an integral part of gameplay and exploration from that point on. But in Hollow Knight, it's possible for it to be the last ability you even get, and so now you can do things like this. Wow. After getting the Monarch's Wings, you can explore deeper into Kingdom's Edge towards the source of the Falling Ash to the place indicated by Hornet, who herself is here, standing sentinel blocking the way further in. This is indeed the second time you fight Hornet, though the mechanics are identical to the first fight, except sped up. The first time the knight met Hornet back in Greenpath, the encounter was one of pure hostility, with Hornet acting to eliminate the possibility of this strange new visitor making things even worse in Hallownest. But for this fight, rather than the encounter being one of pure hostility, it's more of a test for the knight to see if it's strong enough to actually make a difference here. After the fight, the knight can claim the king's brand within the ashen corpse of a dead worm, with this brand technically making the knight itself the new king. Worms are very mysterious beings in this world, not least of all with them now being extinct, but the very king of Hallownest was himself a worm, transforming in some way into the form of the pale bug from the spike moth corpse here in Kingdom's Edge. It was the pale king who was responsible for the transcendence of Hallownest into a unique kingdom of thinking bugs capable of higher thought, and for the construction of real cities and infrastructure. In the immortal words of Mr. Mushroom, Worms pull bugs into their thrall till ages pass and kingdoms fall. Caps and shells may fall to dust, but Mr. Mushroom readjusts. Farewell my Mushroom Prince, I will always love you. This King's brand appears in several other places throughout the kingdom too, and in fact the shape of the brand is based on the form of the King himself, who himself resembles the form of the Pale Worm. 
With the King's brand, that odd door in the ancient basin will now open to reveal the dark secrets inside, but before all those grim revelations, why not pay a trip to the Colosseum of Fools further up? While the Godmaster DLC would of course later add pure combat focused boss rush challenges, the Colosseum was in the game at launch, putting the player against horde after horde of bug and beast. You first hear word of it much earlier on from a douchebag named Tiso who pops up in Dirtmouth, but although the gameplay here is entirely based on fighting waves of enemies, there is an interesting lore aspect to it also. As we've seen, nearly all of Hallownest is crippled and frenzied by the infection, with the exception of the Mantis villagers who've managed to ward it off through discipline and strength of mind. But the Colosseum of Fools is also something of an outlier, because although its inhabitants are infected, they don't just attack the knight on sight, saving it for within the arena, thus retaining at least some degree of control from their previous lives before the infection. It's also possible that the gladiators here deliberately embrace the infection so as to increase their ferocity in combat at the expense of all else, and this is a theme which crops up again with a different group of bugs later on. I have a pretty painful history with the Colosseum to be honest. See, there are just three trials to undertake, with various rewards of geo and rare items for victory. The first trial, the Trial of the Warrior, is a decent challenge but nothing crazy. Then, the Trial of the Conqueror is harder still, but still perfectly achievable. Then, you get to the Trial of the Fool, and it's one of the hardest things I've ever done in a game. In fact, the very first time I played Hollow Knight years ago, I spent several days trying to beat it before literally just giving up. I don't flat out give up on things very often in games, but I just had to throw in the towel. I just could not do it and it was making me not enjoy the game. But I resolved to finally beat it this time around, spending hours on it, repeatedly failing and getting increasingly pissed off to the point where I once again just gave up. It was simply beyond my skill level. But an hour later, I got that niggling feeling, that itch to give it just a few more shots. I was making a video on the bloody game for Christ's sake. And so after loading up the game once again, after an hour of fighting through primal aspects, soul twisters, mantis traitors, then eventually the god tamer, a boss unique to the Colosseum, I eventually claimed victory, getting the full PlayStation trophy for the first time and even filling out the final entry in the Hunter's Journal. A strategy that helped massively for this was to make frequent use of nail arts, the Great Slash in particular, especially for airborne enemies. But Jesus, there are parts in this trial that I find utterly unpleasant to play through, especially that notorious part with the floor spikes. Honestly, the Colosseum is the closest I've came to disliking the game. Obviously it never came close to spoiling it, let's not get silly now. But Christ on a bike I found this so hard and really just unpleasant at times. It's not that I think the Colosseum is objectively too hard, it's just that I think it's a bit too hard for me. But hey, I did eventually beat it and it only took me about 4 years. An effective charm setup is a must too, and while for most of the game I just popped on a few decent charms without paying too much thought towards it, things like Quick Focus, Quick Slash, Mark of Pride, and of course the massively overpowered Wayward Compass. You really need to optimise your setup for the game's harder challenges, and work out what you want to be focusing on too. It generally seems best to focus on either a physical damage setup or a magic setup, rather than trying to be a jack of all trades. You can get creative with charm setups though, and many have interesting synergies with each other, though personally, I mostly stuck to the same few throughout the whole game. You get some interesting and exotic charms towards the end if you're keen to catch them all, and some even have interesting mini quests and challenges tied towards reaching them, and I like that these charms are here, but I just never saw the need to use things like Joni's Blessing, Glowing Womb or Defender's Crest, as amusing as it may be to leave behind the foul stench of shit in your wake. Back to the Colosseum though, one of the highlights of the whole game, in my opinion, occurs at the end of the Trial of the Warrior when we finally bear witness to the impossible power of Zolt the Mighty. As hilarious as this encounter is, especially with the fact that he literally can't damage you, there really is some depth to what pops up after striking him with the Dream Nail. I'll kill a thousand more, will that be enough father? See throughout the whole game, Zolt is a complete joke, and as such, he's bloody hilarious vastly overstating his capabilities in a rather pathetic attempt to make the other bugs take him seriously, to the point where he's even managed to fool himself. But even so, you never dislike him as a character. In fact, I'm sure most people playing actually like him, even though he is a wee fanny, as we say in Scotland. 
If you return back to Dartmouth after the Colosseum, Greta has become quite besotted with Sot, and whereas before the knight was the sole object of her affections, we've been given the old heave-ho in place of Zot, the mighty. And to be honest, I was glad, because I absolutely loved hearing the hilarious professorial ramblings of Zot any time I came back here. The decision to make all the characters speak in complete gibberish was perfectly executed, because even though they aren't using actual words, the voice actors still managed to enunciate all their noises, moans and murmurs in such a way where every sound and syllable sounds wholly intentional and filled with meaning. I don't know if I missed it back on my first playthrough or something, because I couldn't recall this next part at all, but engaging Zot in dialogue here leads to an extensive lesson on his 57 precepts of Zot, and there are literally 57 different precepts here, each with her own follow-up explanation, providing ever more insight into this character and the way he thinks and sees himself. Some of these are pretty funny, but others are quite tragic, like Precept 11, Mothers Will Always Betray You, or Precept 51, Nothing Is Harmless, Given the Chance Everything in this world will hurt you. Friends, foes, monsters, uneven paths. Be suspicious of them all. As part of the Hidden Dreams DLC, Team Cherry added in an optional dream fight against Grey Prince Zoot, initiated at a shrine in Bretta's basement, and again it's hilarious, though this imaginary version of the character is genuinely challenging, in stark contrast to the real thing. Although it's a really great, engaging boss, I felt kinda sad after it, cause whereas before Bretta listens in rapt attention to Zote's extensive philosophies, each time you beat the Grey Prince, she'll become less interested, gradually becoming more disillusioned up until you beat it for a fourth time, whereupon she'll leave entirely, all the while Zote continues prattling on obliviously. It's actually pretty damn sad to be honest, cause you never see Bretta again after this, she just leaves. The Grey Prince fight actually gets more difficult each time you fight it too, and the fourth iteration of it does double damage per hit, resulting in one of the most frustrating boss fights in the game for me. It was brutal, and there's not even a reward for it. The only thing that happens is Bretta leaves, making me feel even worse than before. So you can just go off and start hunting down the three dreamers at this point, you can also enter through the King's Brand door in the Ancient Basin, leading into the most enigmatic level of the game one even more quiet and colourless than the ancient basin, the abyss, drenched and entrenched within an ambiguous inky black void populated only by a few scuttling insects. At the very bottom, instead of pits of spikes or the threat of devourment by swarms of writhing insects like in the deep nest, grotesque abyssal tendrils grasp out of the night here, actively reaching up at us, acting as living obstructions in some places, meaning that even the crystal heart is of no utility here. Although everything else in this level is archaic and void drenched, there is one remaining structure, that being the lighthouse, which upon activation quells the roiling tendrils below, allowing passage onward. There's even a deceased lighthouse keeper here whose empty eye sockets are actually oozing with abyssal fluid, presumably indicating that close proximity to the void over time is fatal and detrimental to the mind. An interesting touch with these aggressive shades is that they're one of the only enemies in the game to not fill up the soul vessel at all upon being attacked, obviously because these things have no soul, perhaps they're even the opposite of whatever a soul is. At the east end of the abyss we get our penultimate ability, the Shade Cloak, allowing passage through the shade gates blocking passage to many advanced sections of the kingdom. Rather than this being a brand spanking new ability though, it's more of a modification or enhancement to the Mothwing Cloak because it also provides complete invincibility frames whilst dashing, which is huge. Prior to this, the only time you ever get iframes is directly after being hit, and that invulnerability period really doesn't last long at all, so the stalwart shell charm can increase this. Now though, instead of the only ways to avoid damage being well-timed jumps or dashes, you can go right through enemy attacks, though this itself is on a cooldown, forcing you to wait one and a half seconds before getting access to the invincibility again, so you can't just spam it or anything. While the Shade Cloak for sure makes combat easier, it's not actually essential to beat any of the bosses, just like how the iframes granted by the Smoke Bomb and Cuphead aren't needed to avoid any attack in that game. Nonetheless, it'd be a bit silly not to come here and pick up the Shade Cloak, and furthermore, its ability to travel through Shade Gates is vital towards achieving more involved endings in the game. At the top of the abyss, Hornet again awaits, 
and it was her who directed The Night Here After All. She says something that really confused me when I first read it, referencing the abyss as the place of the night's birth. I found this odd, because nothing I saw down there seemed to indicate that this is where the night was born, yet this dialogue is stated as if there was some revelation we saw down there, which there was, only I somehow didn't initially even notice it back on my first playthrough, even though it stares you right in the face. I'm of course referencing the absurd number of corpses littering the base of the abyss who look nearly identical to the night, except with variations in horn shape indicating that this is where the night also came from, at least before leaving Hollow Nest entirely to return again later on to kick off this whole adventure. The Abyss is also of course where the other vessels we see around Hollow Nest are from, such as the broken vessel from just above in the ancient basin, and the hanging corpses in the Nosk boss fight. I didn't talk about Nosk before, but suffice to say I beat it first try. Now, we do get a more vivid depiction of the night's abyssal origins later on in the game when we return here, but for now, there are just these strong visual indications of the bottom and the words of Hornet to let us know that this is where our character actually came from, that it was born from a literal void. Another thing she says here is in reference to the game's multiple endings. Either we prolong the world's stasis or face the heart of its infection. As for the former scenario, what she means is that just as the Hollow Knight currently resting inside the temple was used as a sacrifice or vessel for containing the infection in Hollow Nest, a measure which is failing, so too can the Knight become a vessel, becoming the new, true Hollow Knight, not fixing or progressing the world in any way, but merely holding it in stasis, at least until this vessel cracks too, repeating the cycle once again. Or, you could face the heart of the infection, the actual source of the plague afflicting Hollow Nest, the reason why everything failed, though I'll save that discussion for a bit later on. As I've indicated earlier, all this business with the worm and the abyss is totally optional. Furthermore, there is another significant story development here later on in the quest for the Void Heart item, but for now, I think it's about time to start taking on the three dreamers. By the way, just for clarification, I didn't necessarily play through everything in the exact order as presented in this video. This isn't just supposed to be about a random playthrough I had, but rather as a vehicle to give my thoughts and commentary on the game's story, levels, bosses, mechanics and more. And so if you're wondering why I don't have the Shade Cloak for the next few bosses, it's because I'd done things in a different order when I was actually playing it. Just wanted to nip any continuity concerns in the bud there. Although we can go for the Dreamers in any old order, I always go for Lurian, the Watcher, first, resting in the single highest point in the City of Tears, in the Watcher's Spire. The path here is particularly lavish, populated by hordes of Hallow Nest's remaining nobility, with there even being portraits of various figures hanging in the halls as decoration. It's interesting to think of there being an additional class-based hierarchical structure in Hollow Nest, as well as the existing hierarchy inherent between the various bug species. I mean, they certainly played different roles depending on what kind of bug they were, with the stags being resigned to providing transport for the rest of the kingdom's residents, but then you have the lowly maggots which seem to be at the very bottom of the totem pole. Then, there's the smaller details like how every lamp in the game is actually a tiny glowing fly trapped inside a glass sphere making you wonder how these things fit into the larger hierarchy, and how sentient they were. Anyway, none of the homes of the Dreamers are actually new levels themselves, but are all just sub-areas of existing levels, and so the Watcher's Spire isn't too much of a trek. However, before getting access to Lurian's Dreaming Form to break the first three seals, there is of course a boss, the Watcher Knights. Starts off easy, sure, but then as the battle progresses, a further five additional knights rouse from apparent death, being given animus by the orange miasma of plague suspended in a rancid cloud of mist and moths along the ceiling. It kind of tricks you into thinking you'll need to fight every one of these visible knights in the background, but thankfully not. This can be a really tricky fight, and apparently a lot of folk take on the Watcher's Spire second or even last because of this, but after one death I got through it. Okay, four deaths. For each of the three dreamers, although there will either be a boss or some other difficult section to fight through beforehand, it's all straightforward once you reach their sleeping forms, just requiring a slash with a dream mail so as to enter their dream realm, then striking their unresisting figures a few times before they're vanquished. 
It's important to note how the Watcher makes no attempt to fight back here, even though it almost certainly can. We fight other enemies in Dream Realms who are more than formidable in these environments, but it's clear that regardless of the Watcher's sworn duty to maintain its seal, one it clearly takes extremely seriously as per the words on the nearby tablet, the Dreamers are aware that the vessel they thought pure is failing, and that their seals are swiftly becoming redundant. For my second Dreamer of choice, I headed westward in the direction of the Deep Nest. Of course, I'd visited this nightmare of a level before, but stopped short of pressing on to its westernmost section where things become significantly more… spidery. There are spidery, spidery spiders everywhere here, but just as the previous section of the Deep Nest featured those obnoxious dirt carvers which carved up out of the, well, dirt, the Weaver's Den sub-area has spiders which can just materialise from some unseen foreground. I'm not too big on spiders by the way, so as you can imagine, I just love this area. It's these masked enemies called Stalking Devouts that really got me tilted though. Any enemy or boss which does 2 points of damage per hit instead of the usual 1 really knocks you out of the usual sloppy way of playing, because now if you get hit, it really, really matters, requiring a particularly high degree of care, taking extra time to bait out enemy attacks, instead of just charging in recklessly, because you can go from full health to almost no health remarkably quickly in this game. Speaking of masked monstrosities, there's a curious character hidden behind a breakable wall known only as Midwife, who scared the shit out of everyone, or maybe just me, by trying to take our fucking head off mid-conversation. There's no actual quest related to this character as far as I know, she's mostly just here to creep you out, though she does mention some sad creature waiting in the village above, one who'd made some tragic sacrifice. The creature in question here is in fact Hera the Beast, Another dreamer who as well as being the former queen of Deepnest is also the mother of Hornet, whose father was the Pale King. Although it's easily missable, if you've already gotten the King's Brand before taking out Hera within her own dream realm in the exact same unresisted manner as with Lurian, after the seal was broken, Hornet appears in the bedchamber and gets a bit emotional about her mother whose existence we effectively just ended. It's a really sad wee scene, and even though it's just a few lines of dialogue, it adds a new emotional dimension to Hornet's character, because she's mostly pretty cold and straight talking in all other occasions. I'm sure there are some people watching who didn't even know this scene was a thing, because it's easy to miss if you do things in a different order. With Lurian, it's clear he wanted to become a dreamer, deeming it an honourable sacrifice towards protecting Howl Nest, but for Hera, it was a bit different and instead of doing it for the kingdom she was largely disconnected from, she did it with the agreement that her and the king would have a child, adding an additional level of tragedy to the whole affair, especially when you consider that the three dreamer seals have outlived their usefulness. And so, that leaves just one more dreamer. Although their icons are all clearly marked on the map, that doesn't mean the routes towards them are all that straightforward, because it's not necessarily obvious at first glance which level they're even located in and you might not even have the prerequisite ability just yet. I remember having a bitch of a time trying to work out how the hell to reach Monomon the teacher, but she's located at the centre of Fog Canyon, and as far as I'm aware, you have to have either the Shade Cloak or Ismus Tear to reach her teacher's archive sub-area. Ismus Tear is by far the more situation specific ability in the game, even more so than the Crystal Heart, only being of any actual utility in levels containing damaging acid, like Green Path. Fog Canyon and Kingdom's Edge, but having very little impact in combat encounters. Actually getting Ismus Tear is well worth doing though, because it features what might be the game's funnest boss. Obviously I'm talking about the Dung Defender. It's nearly impossible for me to fight this boss without smiling at those ridiculous noises, again voiced by William Pellin. <laughs> This guy's got a hell of a vocal range. Salubra, the Dung Defender, Leg Eater, even Mr. Mushroom. What a talent. The Dung Defender is tricky, but he's more comical than posing any proper challenge. The White Defender, on the other hand, is crazy tough, essentially just being an intensified version of the Dung Defender, again added as per the Hidden Dreams DLC, just like Grey Prince Soot and accessible by dream slashing the sleeping knight down in his shitty lair, complete with affectionate dunk sculptures made to resemble the five great knights of Hallownest, of which the dung defender himself was a part of. Also, this outer sculpture is meant to represent the Pale King, with those characteristic four spikes coming from its head. 
I'm really glad we don't actually kill the Dung Defender at any point, because he's a great noble character. And you can even speak with him afterwards for some delightful dialogue where he discusses the infection and how the five great knights were powerless against it, as well as commenting on the cruel method the Pale King attempted to try and quell the plague, referring to the sacrifice of the Hollow Knight, with even that ending in failure. Isma's tear lies further in the royal waterways, within her secluded grove, though Isma herself seems to have transformed into some bizarre tree being, or somehow fused with this acidic yet verdant underground grove, in stark contrast to her more recognisable luminescent representation in the background of the White Defender fight. The Dung Defender gives additional dialogue too, if you return after being blessed with the tear, with him appearing to have been guarding the way into her grove, Though he also admits he hasn't actually visited her in there, possibly even being unaware of what she's transformed into, or at least unable to face it. Again, you've got a really funny, fun character, with a surprising level of genuine depth, all conveyed with about 10 or so lines of dialogue. I'd honestly say the Dung Defender is my number one favourite character in the game. In fact, I love him so much, I wrote a song about him. Back to Monomon though, I didn't actually have Isma's tear when I came here, so it was a decent bit harder for me, sadly. We do have a companion before venturing into the archives though, with Quirrell appearing at the entrance, claiming to have some undetermined familiarity with this place. Quirrell's backstory was actually fleshed out a decent bit in the Hollow Knight comic, which shows him journeying to Hollow Nest, ostensibly as an explorer, though in reality, he's being subconsciously drawn to the kingdom, with his distinctive mask being a key element to the significance of his return. Within the teacher's archives, we get a boss battle with Umu, and although it's certainly not one of my favourites in terms of mechanics, it's for sure one of the most memorable thanks to the help provided by Quirrell throughout the fight. And I believe this is the only boss in the whole game where we fight alongside an ally, though something similar does also occur in the final boss. By the way, this boss theme is insanely good. Although I'm sure it has its fans out there, this isn't one of the tracks you typically hear people talk about, but I am blown away by how good this song is. Decent degree of rhythmic complexity to it too, the way it starts off in 5-4 before transitioning to 6-4 for the main riff. Is this Hollow Knight or Dream Theatre? Christopher Larkin, you're the man. Monomon is rather different from the other two dreamers, in that rather than laying on some bed or altar, she's suspended in a tank, and thus, she's actually out of reach which is where Quirrell comes in. There was an additional measure of security for this third seal, and that measure is the very mask carried around by Quirrell this whole time, it being the reason he was called back to Hallow Nest. Previously, Quirrell was actually Monomon's apprentice, having accepted the responsibility to carry her mask before she began her sacred role as a dreamer. With the transfer of the mask from apprentice to dreamer, the dream realm can now be entered and the third seal can be broken, leaving the black vault within the temple of the black egg open for the first time in untold ages. Now at this point in the game you are completely free to travel back to the infected crossroads to take on the boss within the temple and even achieve the first of the game's endings. So let's do that. Obviously there's a bunch of other stuff to still be doing, but a nice thing about Hollow Knight is that after getting any of its 5 endings, it will dump you right back into the game for you to finish off any other business, and in fact you can even achieve all 5 endings in the one playthrough, which is really nice. And so begins the entry into the temple, through the now unsealed Black Vault. A notable aspect associated with the decision to take on the Hollow Knight at this stage is that there's no one here to greet us, not even Hornet and that's because choosing to face the Hollow Knight in this manner is choosing to hold Hollow Nest in stasis, just as Hornet said at the top of the abyss, and thus begins the fight against the vessel, chosen by the Pale King to contain the mind-blasting plague which brought the kingdom to its knees. I've heard people complain that this boss is a bit too easy, and although you can certainly die to it, I should sure have, yeah, it's not a massive challenge, at least when compared to the game's hardest bosses but I think that was intentional. Although the Hollow Knight does have some tricky attacks to deal with, there are plenty of opportunities to absolutely wail on it, or just step back for some cautionary heals. Rather than difficulty being the thrust of this fight, it's clearly primarily supposed to be intense, 
dramatic and climactic, and Team Cherry absolutely nailed that. The way it violently stabs itself in frenzied self-destructive desperation in a vain effort at getting rid of the infection is really dark, powerful stuff, because the entire purpose of the Hollow Knight's creation was to contain the infection, and the boss's roars and self impalements throughout the fight really convey its rage and frustration that it failed in its one mission. But after its defeat, a new vessel takes its place, that being our character, the new Hollow Knight. Nothing changes, nothing is fixed, Hollow Nest remains in ruin, and its inhabitants remain without their minds. Suffice to say, this is not a positive ending at all, and furthermore, who's to say this new vessel won't eventually crack at some point in the future? There's not even a seal on the vault, whereas there were three before. And so, fuck that, there's got to be a better way, and indeed there is. Though you could be forgiven for utterly missing it unless you look up a step-by-step -step guide online, as I certainly had to. See, when Hollow Knight eventually came to console, it was released as the Void Heart edition, to which I thought, cool, I don't know what that is. However, the Void Heart is key towards seeking a more hopeful future for Hollow Nest, so there's a good bit more work required to actually obtain it. Before that though, you know, I'm a little light on coinage these days. Good thing I deposited four and a half thousand dollars at the bank near Queen Station. Oh, fuck! So, if you deposit two and a half thousand geo or more with Millibel, she'll straight up skedaddle out of dodge with absolutely zero indication of where she's gone to. Because of this, on my first playthrough I just straight up thought that was it, and that I'd lost all my money. And so I just carried on the game, with my pocket several thousand geo lighter. But no, turns out you can get all your money back. It's just really easy to miss, but also pretty hilarious. But also kind of tedious after the first 15 seconds bouncing this old lady around. Can I please just have all my geo back? Please and thank you. The pleasure house where Millibel is to be found is of course located in the City of Tears, but not only is there a pleasure house in the capital, but there's also a Tower of Love. Maybe there's even a Palace of Passion too that I haven't found yet, or a Castle of Co- Perhaps the game's weirdest boss is to be found within the Tower of Love, the Collector. Now we've seen life forms throughout the kingdom which don't really fit into the category of bug, like in the Fungal Wastes and Fog Canyon. But the only beings in the world in any way resembling the Collector would have to be the Shades from the Abyss. Though rather than those silent, floating forms, this dude, or thing, is out of its damn mind. Really cool gimmick to the fight though, in that he chucks jars filled with various bugs at you from his collection, hence the Collector. There's a super interesting theory around why the Collector is the way it is, pertaining to the corpse where you find the elegant key from within the Queen's Gardens, but it's not my theory, it's Mossbags. So instead of me just retelling it here, go and watch his awesome lore video on the biggest mysteries remaining in Hollow Knight. The reward for beating the Collector is fantastic though, giving you the Collector's map, revealing the locations of every remaining grub in the world. I was shocked as hell when I actually looked at the map and saw grubs everywhere I'd somehow missed, though to be fair, some are really well hidden. Still, I expected to see maybe two or three grubs tucked away in some obscure corner that had passed me by, but in reality there was still about 11 that I had to find. The rewards are great for finding these things, and it's always great fun to be showered in riches after finding a new grub, and even a couple of charms and a pale ore towards a new nail upgrade. All is well. The grubs are happy, the grub father's happy, I'm happy with my new fancy nail and vast accumulation of wealth. Hey, let's go visit the grubs, and we can all celebrate together and start sucking each other's dicks or whatever, and... Grub father, what have you done? Yeah, pretty sad and disturbing revelation here when it turns out you've been collecting grubs for him to devour, and you can even hear them crying out from the depths of his stomach no doubt soon to be digested alive into a grubby mush. Sick shit, it kinda makes you feel bad for facilitating this. It dampened the impact at least a little bit if you were at least able to take the grub father out, but he's literally invincible here. We can destroy the Hollow Knight, sure, but the grub father after he's had his lunch, far too powerful. Now that those various errands, as amusing and also devastating as they were, are taken care of, it's time to carry on with the mission to save Hollow Nest, and on to a new level, the Queen's Garden, accessible either with the help of the Shade Cloak or Ismus Tear. 
The Queen's Garden is something of an extension of Dream Path, maintaining the theme of bright, flourishing verdancy, though now no longer under the influence of Un, the gargantuan god of Green Path, having since been claimed by the Queen, also known as the White Lady, situated within a den at the most remote corner of the garden and guarded by the pale corpse of Dryer, one of the five great knights. I'd say that out of every level in the game, the Queen's Garden is the hardest for me to play through. Not in the sense that it's shit and that I don't like it, because I do like it, but because it's filled with environmental hazards as well as one of the most annoying enemies in the game, the Flying Mantis Petra enemies. Holy crap, these things suck. They appear in the Colosseum and are a nightmare there too. There are also Mantis Traitors here, which are like the Mantis Warriors from the Fungal Wastes, but significantly trickier to deal with having much better range and an ability to jump. I don't know what it is, but I just can't seem to get good when fighting these things. They always catch me out. The origin of their labelling as traitors is based on both them and their lord being cast out of the Mantis village. They were deemed traitors for embracing the infection for the strength it gave them, before even going so far as to turn upon their non-infected brethren and sistren. Of course, we see the strong code of honour present in Mantis Village, but there is no such code with these enemies, and that's especially the case with the Traitor Lord who prevents the way forward to the White Lady. I might just get lambasted as an unskilled scrub for what I'm about to say, but I find the Traitor Lord to be absolutely brutal. He's essentially an absurdly buffed version of the Mantis Traitors, doing double damage and having way more range. And just like with the fourth Grey Prince Zote fight, the double damage aspect is particularly troublesome for me, and I get very easily tilted when I see my health go down so fast, usually leading to me taking even more damage because of how pissed off I get. Speaking of the Traitor Lord, there's another quest associated with this figure, at least by extension, and that figure is the Grey Mourner the second of the only two living great knights left in Hallownest, though her home is very well hidden within the resting grounds. Although I do love the design of this character, as well as the rather endearing way she kind of wiggles her head as she's speaking, I'll be damned if I know what the hell she is. In fact, she looks more like a flower than a bug. Regardless of whether she's a bug, a flower or this piece of paper I just folded up, she is the giver of one of the most challenging quests in the game, requiring you to deliver a flower from this location all the way over to the grave of her lover, the traitor's daughter, deep within the Queen's gardens. Simple. It couldn't be easier. Straightforward. Except you need to do all this without getting hit a single time. No. Oh Pro fucking hell. Also you can't use any stag stations. I've had such stressful times with this quest before, and back on my first playthrough, it honestly must have taken me about 20 attempts, no joke, but for as frustrating as it can be to try and make your way from one side of the map to the other, and terminating in one of the most challenging areas in the game, with some of the most challenging enemies in the game no less, I also think it's one of the best quests in the game. Like I said a good bit earlier, as difficult as it is, Hollow Knight is a remarkably forgiving game. You can make multiple mistakes in nearly every room and take a ton of hits in nearly any boss fight and still come out on top thanks to the healing mechanic, a mechanic which can be even further enhanced with various charm setups. In fact, you get so used to the game's forgiveness that maybe you start to get a bit sloppy. This certainly occurred to me, especially towards the end when I'd been making my way through earlier, easier areas because I knew I just wasn't in any danger. So who cares if I take a bit of damage on these spikes or on this random enemy? Then you get to this quest and it completely turns that way of playing on its head, all of a sudden demanding perfection. That said, you can make it way easier by just killing all the enemies along the route beforehand, and while the stack stations are a no-go, the tramways are fair game. Even using this method though, there are still the environmental hazards to watch out for. Several times now, I've reached the Queen's Gardens, with only a wee bit of distance to go till I reached the grave, before my nerves failed me and I dodged directly into some thorns like a dumbass. This whole quest is totally optional of course, but personally I love everything about the history of the Hallowness Five Great Knights, and wanted to interact with them as much as possible. The real reason for coming to the Queen's Gardens, however, is to visit the White Lady, who has apparently been waiting for us, or, as she qualifies, at least one like us. Cast your mind back to the countless scores of vessels littering the floor of the Abyss. The White Lady also comments on our encounter with Hornet, who she refers to as the gendered child, 
mentioning the worm's dalliance with Hornet's mother, Hera the Beast. The topic of motherhood is important because as it happens, the knight, the hollow knight and every other dead or infected vessel throughout Hallownest was in fact a product or child of both the Pale King and the White Lady, making Hornet the knight's half-sister on the side of the king. Her other dialogue here is quite interesting and odd because she asks the knight to usurp the hollow knight and take its place as a vessel, but as we already know, that's really no solution at all given the current state of Hallownest. However, it's not clear exactly how aware the White Lady is of conditions on the outside world, being sequestered here and only receiving echoes of the greater world through her roots, and so maybe she doesn't understand how messed up everything already is. But in any case, she gives us a white fragment, a charm which is useless on its own, but of far greater significance when combined with its other half. Regarding that other half, what is one fragment lay with the White Lady who was Queen, the other of course rests with the Pale King, though he is no longer to be found in the physical world. Much like the Three Dreamers, the only way to access the palace where the King hid himself so as to escape the dread of the infection is via the Dream Realm. However, our plain old Dream Mail ain't gonna cut it. After collecting 1800 essence via whispering roots and dream fights, the seer will upgrade your ethereal weapon into the awoken dream mail, allowing access into even the most protected of minds. Also, I can't listen to the noise that she makes here without laughing, I love it so much. <laughs> If you return back to the Seer with 2400 essence, she'll spill some extremely important details on the history of her moth tribe and of the actual source of the plague, a subject that the game has been largely silent on until now. The source in question is the Radiance, the original higher god of Hallownest and the subject of worship by the nearly extinct moth tribe of which the Seer was a part of. As we know from Mr. Mushroom, worms hold kingdoms in their thrall, which is exactly what the Pale King did when he materialised out of the corpse of his Pale Worm. And with his revolutionary introduction of true sentience, the bugs of Hallownest, or whatever it might have been called back then, if it even had a name at all, turned from the light of the Radiance to favour the light of the King. However, while forgotten by most, the Radiance still lived on, casting its influence into the dreams of bugs throughout the kingdom, turning them into the mindless husks we see everywhere. To combat this, the king took measures to contain the influence of the Radiance within a vessel, which is the origin of the Knight and the origin of the Hollow Knight, beings born of the Void who supposedly have no minds, and thus no minds for the Radiance to influence. However, as we know, this measure failed because of some flaw in the chosen vessel, and thus the Radiance's influence continued to grow throughout the now lost kingdom, while the vessel within the temple continued to crack, spilling out ever more infection into the immediate area, and then perhaps the entire kingdom if left unchecked for too long. Thus, the true enemy of this game is the Radiance, the jealous god who would not be forgotten. With the help of the Awoken Dream Mail, a new Dream Realm can be entered, accessible via a strange pale corpse in the palace grounds to the east of the ancient basin, transporting the knight to a new level entirely, the White Palace. Now the first time I've even played through this level was actually only a couple of weeks ago, and to be honest, I was expecting the worst. I'd heard that the White Palace was one of the hardest sections of the game, being an ordeal of brutal, painful, punishing platforming. However, Although I certainly found it to be decently challenging, I was a bit surprised at how easily I was getting through it. The White Palace is just a large series of platform based challenges, complete with hazards which don't appear anywhere else, like these bus saws to be specific, both moving and stationary. As such, a great degree of dexterity is required here, with well timed jumps, dashes, wall bounces and crystal dashes being essential for surviving the trials of the palace. Thankfully, a decent charm setup makes all this way more achievable, particularly deep focus which doubles the efficacy of healing, essentially giving you twice the amount of health. And indeed, after working my way through every terrifying hazard, I reached the throne room of the Pale King, now he's sitting dead. The only thing left to do here was to strike the corpse with a nail, yielding the second white fragment to form the King's soul. Soul of worm, soul of root, heart of void. I'd done it. Had conquered the notorious White Palace. 
Funny though. I did remember people talking about some part of the game called the Path of Pain. I'd assumed that must have been what I'd just done. I mean, it was relatively painful. But then I looked it up online. Turns out, the Path of Pain is an additional, absurdly well-hidden part of the White Palace. Well, guess I'd better give it a shot. How bad could it be? Folks, I'll be honest, this is too fucking hard for me, and that's not the last time I'll say those words in this video. I was barely able to even get through the first few obstacles, and I know it only gets much, much worse from here. There's certain content in Hollow Knight where it was clear that it was not made for everyone, and that's fine. It's just like the seasides from Celeste. I managed that whole game and collected every strawberry and even got through the B-sides, but when it came to the seasides, Ah, it's just a bit out of reach. I know I could do them if I spent hours and days dying over and over again, making a little bit more progress each time, but I just don't quite have that desire. As rewarding as it'd feel to eventually succeed, the overall process wouldn't be fun enough to warrant that. It'd be more stressful than anything. Nonetheless, there is a reward for making it through the path of pain, and I've seen it on YouTube, and as absurdly brief as it is, I absolutely love it, because it gives a strong hint about why the whole night failed. The idea was for the vessel to be pure, free of thought or any will, thus impossible for the Radiance to manipulate. However, here we see the Pale King and the Hollow Knight share a brief moment with each other, perhaps just enough of an emotional connective flicker to create some small weakness or flaw in the vessel. It makes the story of the Hollow Knight that much sadder too because it did not ask to be created, nor was it responsible for its flaw. The whole night also does appear much smaller here too of course, though it's never really explained in game how it later grew to its full height, or whether the same thing would happen to our short ass character at some point. Now that we have the king's soul, it can actually be equipped as a powerful charm, providing passive soul accumulation over time, though we didn't go through this whole rigmarole for some fancy charm, you hear? The real prize is the void heart but to get it, we have to return back down into the abyss, where a fresh chasm opens up upon the knight's approach, exposing a cavern composed entirely of its abyssal brethren, fused and cemented into a morbid maze of mask and shade. Although we already knew that this is where the vessels were birthed, this is where you truly see the horrific circumstances behind the selection of the vessel, as countless rejected vessels fall from above either because they weren't strong enough to scale back up and out of the abyss, or because they were struck back down after being deemed unsuitable. And thus, we finally see the stark reality that our own knight was one of the rejects discarded back down into the depths in place of the vessel which would go on to become the Hollow Knight before tragically failing. It opens up some questions too. For example, if our knight was picked to be the vessel, would it also have failed? Was the vessel which was picked really pure at the start only to become flawed later on? Also, how did our knight get out of the abyss, and where the hell did it go before returning back to Hallow Nest later on, and why did it leave in the first place? The aspect of the vessels not having minds or wills is also a bit confusing, because if it doesn't have a mind or will, then how can it go anywhere or do anything, or even fight? In any case, we now have the Void Heart, meaning that we now have the final piece of the puzzle required to reach Hallow Nest's true enemy. This time upon reaching the Temple of the Black Egg, the knight is not alone, with Hornet waiting just outside, though she is her usual cold self. The fight within plays out in the same way as before, except this time, instead of its usual end, Hornet intervenes, temporarily stunning the Hollow Knight, giving you the perfect chance to strike it with a slash from the Dream Nail, only to completely fuck it up like a dumbass, and hit it with your regular nail instead, causing Hornet to be tossed asunder and for the rest of the fight to play out as normal. The ending cutscene here is the same as the one for the first ending, except instead of the knight taking on the mantle of Hollow Knight alone, Hornet is locked in the vault also, with the door now being branded with a seal resembling her face. It's a horrible ending, 
even worse than the first, despite all the extra work required to achieve it. Furthermore, with the three dreamers from before, they were all outside the temple, situated in far-flung corners of Hollow Nest, whereas in this case, the source of the seal is locked inside the temple itself, making Hornet completely inaccessible unless she perishes inside there anyway. She does mention beforehand that this space is built for the vessel and its kind, and that it would drain her if she were to enter for too long. Of course, the only way you'd ever get this ending is if you were completely dense and then pick up on the cue that you're obviously supposed to use your dream nail, or if you're deliberately trying to see the cutscene, as I was. The real conclusion comes if you enter the Hollow Knight's dream realm, the place where the radiance itself is quite literally sealed away. Did anyone else gasp in delight when they saw the sun in the background transforming into the radiance? Because I sure did. Holy shit, what an awesome entrance. To call it epic would be an understatement. What a gloriously incandescent boss. It's just a shame I absolutely suck at it. The radiance gave me tons of trouble here, and I died many times. It's not that its attacks are extremely difficult to deal with, but the two main elements contributing to the tension and challenge of this encounter is that you take two points of damage per hit. Pretty rough. And each time you die, you ought to take on the Hollow Knight all over again. Pretty annoying. An interesting aspect to the Radiance's moveset is that it never actually attacks you directly with its own body. All of its attacks are either hazard or projectile based, while the boss itself just teleports from spot to spot as you attempt to get within striking distance, while also trying to avoid the spikes, lances and lasers. I actually found magic to be extremely useful here, and with a magic focused charm setup, you can do massive chunks of damage with Abyssal Shriek. And what would an epic final encounter be without getting down to just one point of health for the final assault, climbing higher and higher, desperately hoping for an end to the relentless barrage of lasers from above, any one of which would kill me in a single hit, not to mention the blackness of the void below, threatening to swallow the night up in the event of a misstep, before eventually, just as my controller was about to slide out from my sweat-drenched hands, the moth form of the radiance came into view. Thus, in this scenario, the true source of the mindlessness and the infection is vanquished, meaning a far more positive and optimistic outlook for Hallow Nest, and perhaps the world, though it's not quite clear if all the bugs we've seen will suddenly gain sentience again. I mean, yes, the infection is gone, and so is the entity which invaded everyone's dreams. But the Pale King is also long since dead, and it was the King who brought intelligence with him. But I'm still a bit unclear about all that to be honest. Maybe a Lord Diver can let me know their thoughts in the comments about all this. All in all though, this seems like a pretty damn good ending, and Hornet is safe and sound afterwards too, though the fate of the Knight is left a bit more ambiguous, it having broken free of its pale shell to transform into some void creature, a necessary measure to combat the captivating ancient light of the Radiance.
However, that's not quite all there is for Hollow Knight, because of course there's also the DLC content. I've already covered a bit of it with the White Defender and Grey Prince Sword fights and the Path of Pain, but there's also the more substantial content additions, those being the Grim Troop and Godmaster. Also, apparently the Hive Knight boss wasn't added until the White Blood update in April of 2018. I've had to use a wiki as a reference for determining the timeline of the DLC content, because by the time it came out on PS4, every update was already there. Pretty freaking crazy that all the extra content was free though, not to mention the commendably low price of Hollow Knight to begin with. Shit like that is pretty damn rare these days. Compare that to the recent PS4 port of Red Dead Redemption, an over 13 year old game that they've priced at 40 goddamn pounds. That shit sucks. I'll be honest though, my experience of the Grim Troop and Godmaster is a wee bit complicated as I'll soon explain. The way to actually initiate the whole series of events with the Grim Troop is pretty damn out of the way and unobvious, to the extent that many folk will likely need instructions on how to actually get it going, though I guess there is a chance you could just stumble into it. But way back near the damn entrance to the Hollow Nest, behind a breakable wall, always a breakable wall, is a strange bug wearing a mask that looks a bit different from most other masks we've seen. After striking it with the Dream Nail, you can then strike a nearby brazier in the adjacent room to ignite it with a scarlet flame, the likes of which we really haven't seen anywhere else throughout Hollow Nest. In lighting this brazier, or beacon, or whatever it is, a series of events has been set in motion, and indeed, upon returning back to Dirtmouth, there's a couple new tents being pitched up, much to the dismay of the poor old Elder Bug. To be honest, I wasn't really all that taken with the bulk of the Grim Troop content. Most of it just involves you being sent to specific spots around the kingdom to gather flame essence for the Troop Master Grimm's twisted rituals, and so there are no new areas to explore or anything. You're just revisiting previous levels for fairly simple fights with these Grimkin. I mean, it's more content, I guess, and I didn't dislike going through these motions, but nor was it super interesting. Then you return back to Grimm after completing the task, only for him to send you to gather an additional three flames. These ones are a bit more challenging at least, with the enemies having an additional move, but it still all seems a bit like busy work to me. But after acquiring all six flames, we get a boss fight in front of a captive audience of bugs wearing that same distinctive mask. It's Troop Master Grim. Now, I had a bit of a similar lapse in thought here as when I was going through the White Palace, because while I found Grim to be really challenging, he wasn't quite as difficult as I'd expected. With nearly every challenging boss in this game, there's inevitably one attack that I hate, that I can't seem to not get hit by. With Grey Prince Zote, it was his dumb, running nail attack. With the Radiance, it was its radiant lasers. And with Troop Master Grim, it was his big spike attack. It's not even that difficult to evade, but that didn't matter. It usually just hit me anyway. When I finally managed to beat Grim, and it took me a while by the way, I thought, yes, I've beaten the DLC. But in reality, no, I hadn't beaten the DLC. Because my next task was to collect another three flames, and that was about when I remembered a name I'd heard from some old Hollow Knight video I'd seen years ago. What was it? Ah yeah, Nightmare King Grim. But I just fought Grim, and he wasn't called the Nightmare King, he was called the Troop Master. Well, just as I'd mistakenly thought I'd conquered the entirety of the White Palace, I made the same mistake here, because after acquiring yet another three flames and returning to Grim, you can fight the Nightmare King himself. Fuck, I thought. I'm toast. I cannot beat Nightmare King Grim. He is far too difficult. Because that's how I talk. But luckily for me, and perhaps disappointingly for you, the viewer, if anyone's even still watching at this point, there's another option to conclude the tale of the Grim Troop. Although just three flames appeared on the map for the first two rituals, in preparation for the third and final one, four flames actually appear, with one in particular being located away over in Deep Nest, but instead of a Grim Kin, it's Brom, a member of the troop looking to end the practice of harvesting nightmares from each and every fallen kingdom. Following Brum's instructions, you can return back to that first Scarlet Flame which summoned the troop here in the first place and banish them from the Hollow Nest forever. Although you can achieve every ending in the one playthrough for the base game, you can't do this for the Grim Troop content, and so the only way to see the other ending is to play through the whole game all over again. I actually screwed myself out of some top tier charms here too, because you can feed the fragile charms from the Leg Eater to Divine 
for unbreakable variants of them, with the unbreakable strength charm being considered one of the best in the game. But if you banish the troop, then you can never get these upgraded charms. I really wish I'd have known this before going through this, but I guess I should have guessed that choosing to banish the troop might cause them to be, you know, banished. This does seem to be the most positive ending of the two though, with Bronn remaining in Dirtmouth afterwards, though smaller and without his mask, and now going by a different name, with seemingly no memories of what came beforehand. I didn't love this DLC, and nor did I find its associated lore to be as compelling as the base game story, but I liked it well enough, and it was free for God's sake, free! And speaking of God, I guess that brings us to the God Master content, accessible via a, you guessed it, breakable wall or ceiling, I guess, found near the Flukmarn boss arena and the royal waterways, leading to the junk pit, within which stands a locked cocoon holding the corpse of some bizarre ancient bug, and striking it with the dream nail takes you to a brand new dream realm, God Home. So the entire thrust of this content is boss rushes. There are several pantheons which are only unlocked after defeating every associated boss out in Hallownest, after which you can take on particular boss rushes against old bosses you've already fought, as well as some new ones like Nailmaster's Oro and Mato in the Pantheon of the Master, and then the more artistically inclined Nailmaster Shio in the Pantheon of the Artist. The main antagonist through all this is the God Seeker, a regal but cruel figure who detests our presence here, appearing in between some boss fights to let you know just how much the knight disgusts her and that she hopes will die and leave the God home. She's not very nice. So I'm afraid I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about the God Master content, because the truth is, it's just too fucking hard for me, and it's not the sort of content I'm looking for from this game, and that's a shame because two of Hollow Knight's endings are locked behind the single biggest challenge in the entire game, the Pantheon of Hallownest, putting you against 42 bosses in a row, the final three of which are Nightmare King Grim, a much harder version of the Hollow Knight in the form of the Pure Vessel, and a much harder version of Radiance in the form of Absolute Radiance. I mentioned earlier that there is some stuff in this game that clearly wasn't made for everyone to conquer, like the Path of Pain but I think the same is true of the Godmaster content. The first four pantheons will be achievable for most folk, I imagine, but the pantheon of Hallownest is crazy. I'm not sure I could ever beat that, and nor am I all that interested in trying. I really enjoy most boss fights in Hollow Knight, but that's when they're fought within the greater context of the world and story. If I'm having a sandwich, as well as whatever meat and cheese I lay on there, I also like a nice bit of mayo. It just adds to the overall flavour to create a meal or snack that I really enjoy. But if you take away everything else in the sandwich and just give me some bread with mayo on it, I lose interest. I know that wasn't a great analogy, but I tried my best. I do really like that all the Godmaster stuff is here, and I even really like that the Pantheon of Hallownest is here, even if it's not for me, but I'm not a big fan of two of the game's endings being locked behind it. Though, in this day and age, I guess you can just look them up on YouTube. It is quite possible I return to God Home at some point in the future, and maybe I'll even make a video on it, showing my struggle through the pantheons, and who knows, maybe I'll even take down Absolute Radiance at the very end. But for now, for this video, I am content to leave this content alone. Hollow Knight is one of the most magical games I have ever played. Now, that as a statement doesn't seem to have much meaning at face value. I mean, folk usually use more lucid adjectives to describe games they think highly of, like immersive, vast, challenging, beautiful, emotional, compelling, etc. And indeed, all those words could and should be used to describe Hollow Knight, but above that, the game is magical, and near anyone who's explored far and deep into it knows exactly what I mean by that. The entire journey, from beginning to end, is a masterclass in clever and intuitive game design. The world building is some of the best I have ever seen with the game's remarkable attention to detail and its myriad subtleties and secrets to be discovered and interpreted. It features one of the most outstanding OSTs of the last decade. The stunning art style and endearing animations give the game a distinctive and transcendent charm almost never seen in modern games. And to top it all off, the whole game was made by three fucking people. Holy shit. 
In saying all that, Hollow Knight can be a weird one for me. Despite how incredible an experience it provides, its magic tends to dull in my mind over time, and I've even been known to start up a fresh playthrough before losing interest after an hour or so, and I'm not really sure why. That said, I played through the whole thing an additional two times in preparation for this video, and I'm glad I did, because the magic came right back again, more powerful than ever before, and hey, there's still Silk Song to look forward to. It's been in development for a damn while at this point, but personally I am in no rush for it whatsoever. The greatness of Hollow Knight wasn't achieved by recklessly pushing out an unfinished product as tends to be the fashion these days, and so if it takes another 6 months or a year or longer, that's fine by me. And with all that being said, I think that's a perfect time to end the video. I hope you got some enjoyment out of my thoughts on Hollow Knight. As always, cheers for watching and cheerio.